2022. 2022 has been a roller coaster ride. Traffic has recovered well. But this summer faced a perfect storm. Poor energy prices, inflation, staff shortages, delays, bad weather. Where to next? for European aviation. Welcome to everybody to Eurocontrol this morning and a special welcome to everybody who's traveled this morning because we've been holding conferences and events online for the last two, or two years or so. And uh, just to let you know that, as well as everybody here, there's a huge online presence. Uh, it's been streamed uh, currently, and we'll give you the numbers later on, but it's well into th the thousands of people who are looking at this. Our last event was viewed by 20,000 people. So the idea of the conference today is to bring people together after the summer and look at how we managed to deal with our first summer back to serious business um, in really three years. So we cut back off to the, after the pandemic. And the idea is to bring the airports, the air traffic control providers, the leasers, IATA, and I, special thanks to all our speakers that are here today. Um, and thank you for coming. And it's really good to see you. So I'll start off. My job this morning is to start off and to create a little bit of kind of um, controversy. So don't be offended if I intentionally insult you, because it's actually intentional. OK? <laughs> the, the, uh, enjoy yourself today. And, and we'll try and keep everything on time. It's a short conference, and it's very focused on operations. So we start off with the usual thing, which is the great saying, what's going to be the solution tomorrow isn't going to get us to where we are today. But I wanted to just mention something really important to you, is that just at the core of the business as well, it's always important at the start of a conference to mention that the thing that marks our industry out from anything else, and all of you guys here that run airlines, you have a huge airline community here, and airports community, is the fact that the whole system is safe. So at the end of the summer, even though we had a rough summer and a tough summer, we at the end of the day, we still had a safe summer. And I think that's really important to say, because it's core to the success of the, of the, of the industry. Now, all of the conferences that you go to, I'm going to get this over very early. So I want to say the word three times, sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. Because remember, if you go to a conference nowadays, an aviation conference, and you don't use that word a lot, you're deemed a black sheep, OK? So it's very important that you work it in. And I've got it out early, and I'll, I'll deal with it later on. But these are three other buzzwords as well that are doing um, the rounds. Um, aviation, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, and of course, drones. You know, here in Europe Control, we do a lot of work on drones. Now, I'm going to put something out there. I don't know how people are going to make money on drone taxis. And I'm looking forward to the panel actually working that out for me. Do these things actually work? And is there something that we need to be doing? Or am I missing the plot here completely? Because I think it's important. And of course, we have everything else that's going on with cyber and all this kind of thing as well. So to kind of just set the scene this morning, I think it's important just to mention that, you know, Europe is not the center of the world anymore. And that's a really important thing for us to, re to, to remember. I actually, when they were doing this famous map they used to do, used to show the center of it was heading east. But this guy drew a kind of a chart where he squeezed everybody in on a circle. And you can see basically India and China. That's where the action is. And you know, the US looks quite small when you compare it to that. So there is, you've got this kind of whole rising middle class income. And all of these kind of guys are there. And last week, I was in ICAO with, with Willie Walsh. And the whole issue of climate change was being discussed. And believe me, people in developed countries in Europe and people in India and China do not see the problem the same way. They see the problem that we've had in Europe 100 years of destroying the climate, of emissions. And they, we're not willing to give them 50 years to grow and get to the same level that we are. And that's one of the issues that's, that comes up all the time. So the big thing I want to just say to you is that aviation hasn't still recovered. Now, it's not in a bad place, but it still hasn't recovered. And the panels will be much more. When you have Willie and Ingus Kelly and these guys, they're at the core and the hard end of this. But from our point of view here, 
you know, we're seeing a kind of a number of key things here. First of all, you know, last week, and I just always like to pick recent data, so that's basically data up to Sunday night. What's interesting on the North Atlantic is it's only 4% down traffic-wise, so that's pretty good. And the biggest disappointment, of course, is if you have a look at this, minus 29 going to Asia. So this is really the thing that's hitting the Lufthansa's and the Air France's and the KLM's of this world, because basically they're not getting the traffic that's going to go to Asia, and they're not getting the connecting flights, and that's, that's depressing our system. So, you know, you can see that basically I would have took this graph here very, very handily in January, and I would have been really, really happy with it if I was told this was going to be the outcome in the summer. So that's basically good news. The other point I just want to, to mention to you is a question of how did we do this summer? Well, how we did this summer was very simple. You know, we got to 87% of 2019 uh, over, the, over the summer. We classified the summer here in Eurocontrol as June, July, August, and September. It used to end in August, but you know, kids keep going to holidays for another month or so. So it's 87%. And what's depressing it, of course, is obviously the long haul. So if we look at how the airlines did, and then we look at the problems that generated. First of all, the airlines did, I think, pretty well. It was a kind of a tale of two cities. The uh, guys that prepared did very well. Those that didn't, didn't do very well. So if you have a look, for instance, at number eight there, British Airways, right? So we're looking at the last week there, basically 25% down on where they were two years ago, at the, or three years ago at the same time. If you look at um, our guest speaker today, Joseph Raddy, 18% up on what they were. Basically now coming up above in traffic-wise that of British Airways, and the number one operator, Ryanair, with nearly 3,000 flights, which is huge. I mean, it puts them into kind of second place in the world in terms of size of airlines and all that. But I think the big factor that we all have to look at is this, is the difference is that the long-haul legacy carriers have struggled to get back uh, into operation. This is the thing we want to tease out with Willie Walsh. You know, basically, you know, when you close China, you affect Lufthansa very heavily because they have a lot of dependent flights there. And one flight going to China generates three flights throughout the network. And I think that that's really important for us all to say. But, you know, airlines like SAS struggling out of bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, these are also the airlines as well, you know, that get a lot of state aid. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Because if you look at these are IATA figures, so, so I, I can't get too much criticism, this is the checkbook that bailed out all the airlines. But I think it's important to realize that even in Europe, we think that we bailed out the airlines quite a lot. We didn't really when you compare it to what the Americans did. And the bottom line is the Americans take the checkbook out much faster with less conditions. And in my view, they, 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 they roll it out very quick. So there's been a kind of a whole circle there basically on this. And you can see, for instance, that um, you know, it's divided up basically between cash, wage subsidies, ticket tax, but everybody got something. And I think it was very timely how it worked out and how the whole thing got. So it's been really, really good from that point of view. Now, here is a not so nice slide. And don't want to offend anybody in the room. But this is basically June, September, what we call non-operated schedules. That's a nice technical term for cancellations, okay? So basically, if you look at the amount of flights in this period that were cancelled by the main operators. That's fights that were filed and should have operated the day before and actually then didn't operate, okay? And uh, w basically, you can see that, you know, SAS, of course, was a big problem, and you can see it runs right down throughout the spectrum, averaging about 6% in the EU um, totally. You see, for instance, Air France, about 4.5%, and you can see KLM, about 66 .6, Whiz, about 68 Rainer about 1.5. So a big variety throughout the network. And this is what the consumers are always very interested in, is do, can they go reliably to the airport and make sure that they can actually operate the flight? So, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what Joseph has to say about this going forward, because I think it's going to be really important. Now, when you go to an airport, this is the year-to-date figures. Basically, you have a 71% chance this year of your flight being on time. That's been in within 15 minutes of the time that it says on your ticket. And you have a 65% of the thing actually, um, sorry, departing and arriving, 71, 61. And you can see it's down on 2019, and we'll explain that. But let's just have a look f at the last week. Now, last week was unusual. We had a French strike, uh, things were difficult, but generally the pro performance of the system is a little bit suboptimal at the moment, and that's, there's no doubt about that. It's 11% below 2019. And the problem is that when you do have a delay, you can have actually quite a long delay. 
And if the average delay is 45 minutes, and if you're part dealing with the average, you could be up on you know, two hours or something like that. So this is the whole system delay, which we're trying to measure and get people to appreciate it from that point of view. Now, the other part of the, of the whole um, uh, network is very important part, is the airports. And basically, we got ourselves into a kind of a knot this summer with airports in that the airlines, to an extent, came back much stronger than the airports. But the airport was caused by basically lack of security, guards, cleaners, and all this. And a lot of these people had been furloughed, had, had left. There were people who were on low wages as well and had moved on and then were not rehired. And that's a really important thing to realize is that, you know, we have to be looking at things like the ground handling directive and all this to make sure that you keep a supply of workers for the airport because if you don't pay them enough, they're not going to work there. And I think that that's one issue that is coming, come, has come across from our research this summer, and that's something I'd like to ask the panels to address, and we'll be looking at it especially in the afternoon. But definitely, the airports was a source. Lost bags and all kinds of stuff happening in the, air, in the airport. So it was really, really difficult. If I could also just mention to you, how, see if you can read this statistically. It's a, bit, it's a bit small, but you can see there, for instance, we picked um, basically on Sunday, last Sunday, and this is the basic situation with Sunday. So if you pick Ma Milan Malpensa, you're 35% down on where you are in 2019. Now, this is hard for airports because airports get paid per passenger. So if the passengers aren't been generated, if the traffic has not been generated, airports are going to struggle. They're going to struggle for cash flow and they're going to struggle for, for liquidity. So that's a big issue there going along. But you can see that all the airports have done pretty well. It's, it's gone right across the board. And if you see, for instance, pick up Amsterdam, <coughs> You know, we're minus 13% on Sunday. So we're getting there. And again, at the start of the year, I would have gladly accepted these figures if I had been offered them. So moving on from that, of course, comes the great issue of the EU slots debate. And here, the panel, I'm going to leave this to the panel and, and to, to, to Cathy Buick more than, more than me. But, you know, there's a big debate, first of all, whether you should have slots. And second of all, if you do have slots, should you be forced to use them? And at what level? And, you know, there's different views. So I'm going to put that on the table as a topic that we need to deal with today. Because it's something I think, for, particularly for Willie and Olivier, might have different views on. Now, the elephant in the room, of course, always is what nobody wants to talk about, is the single European sky. And basically, it's stalled. The reality is we're not making progress on this. Um, we had, you know, for instance, we need to start looking at doing practical things to help the system. And one of the things I think that we're advocating is a protection of overflights. In other words, you know, where there's industrial action, it happens in the country, but overflights are protected. Something that, you know, keeps at least the system moving along, but doesn't interfere with anybody's right to strike. And that's, again, something that we'll be debating later in the day with Livia and with everybody as to how would this work in practice, if indeed it could work. And Simon, you might deal with it as well, how this works. And the whole question of cost versus capacity. So definitely the elephant in the room is the single European sky. Now, this is what happened last Thursday morning when we arrived in. This is basically a screenshot from the network manager. And you can see that without any real notice, we ended up having... 10 air traffic controllers on strike, I think the number was Jacopo, and we closed most of France. And we cancelled thousands of flights um, with no notice. Now, the previous week we had a strike and we handled it very well because we had notice. And that's the big, big difference. But the network manager situation is, is, is tricky. The other thing I want to say is that Ukraine has been attacked by Russia. And Ukraine is a member state of Euro control here, so we're very strong in our solidarity with Ukraine. But, you know, there's all kinds of things happening as a, as a result of this. One of the things I just want to mention to you is that here in this house here, the network manager, we enforce all the sanctions. We actually deliver the enforcement. So if you look, for instance, there, you can see a screenshot, not much happening in, in Ukraine. And remember, closing Russian Federation airspace has added about four hours to a flight from, say, uh, Frankfurt to Helsinki, or just under three, sorry, three hours to a flight. And basically, everybody is moving south. And what I would just want to mention to you is that with all the military activity, and here Karsten will be there in the, in the afternoon talking about that, you can pick it up. But here's an interesting slide. You might not know this. The EU sanctions do not cover Chinese operators. So this is yesterday's screenshot from the network manager of all the Chinese airlines flying into Liège and Twerp, um, all the cargo guys coming into Europe, and then they, they pick up the cargo or whatever, and they go back. Now, right now, Lufthansa or Air France can't do that. They have got to go south and fly, and that is going to be a contentious issue. Now, why will it be contentious? At the moment, it's below the radar. 
But when you add passengers and China opens up, hopefully by Q1 of next year, then you will see this stream become very intense. And then you will see the carriers that are competing with the Chinese carriers, particularly long haul, shouting about this and what's going to happen. But at the moment, the Chinese carriers have a huge advantage over the European ones. So the other thing I just want to mention, of course, is the fact I was in ICAO last week, and, and um, they're still dealing with the whole issue of the Reiner issue in Belarus. But another interesting issue is the fact that for the first time in real history, a state has basically robbed aircraft, has taken aircraft. Uh, we have the CEO of one of the, the world's largest leaser here today, Ingus Kelly. But the bottom line is they took the aircraft, re-registered them, and they won't give them back. And then, of course, all of the knock-on effects from this. So this has been something perhaps we didn't see and uh, uh, visualize. And, of course, this has been a problem for everybody. And I would say also congratulations, Joseph. You got two aircraft out of leave, or one aircraft out of leave last week. So that was pretty good. And hopefully the other three that you've got in Kiev, maybe we'll get them out pretty shortly for you if we can. So just to summarize on this, on this topic, what, where are we on ATM capacity? If I want to give you a kind of a nugget to take away, in Europe here and in Europe control, we're operating 90% of our 2019 schedule with 80% of our airspace. So it's like the bucket basically has got smaller and the water is just a little bit bigger. And the problem is that the congestion is that the long haul guys are now in our short haul airspace. So what should be going up the yellow path in over Russia, everybody is now going down the red path and to Turkey. And this is causing congestion, especially at peak times of the year. The other thing, of course, is supply chain issues. You know, you've got supply problems all of the time. But if you look, for instance, I mean, one of the big things, and I might tease this out with Angus going forward, is Boeing is having huge supply chain issues, telling carriers that I'm familiar with that they can only deliver a quarter of the mandated um, aircraft this summer. So that's going to be a, a big issue going forward. And the other thing I just want to say to you as well is that, you know, the market shares of the various, of the various people in Europe. Now, this one I like a lot, this slide, because why I like this one is the top left-hand corner has something is where the Americans Department of Labor consider this everyday items, flying. Now, that's good news for everybody in this room. I was really pleased to see flying there, that the Americans consider flying a part and parcel of their inflation calculation. But when you look at it, in the, in the last two months, 33% increase in airfares. So the Americans are getting better airfares than we are in Europe and doing very, very well. But generally, inflation is really nailing us very hard here in Europe. Oil price inflation, same problem again for every single carrier all over, all over Europe. It's a major, major issue. And, you know, it's hitting everybody. Some are hedged, some are not hedged, and I'm sure the panel will discuss that. So just to kind of wrap up on this whole thing today, the big question is what's all this doing for sustainability? Now, in Europe at the moment, we spend a huge amount of time talking about sustainability, and I would say not probably an awful amount of time doing an awful lot about it. So... In North America, if you have a look, for instance, there, you can see what their targets are, you know, basically to, to move on, on for the next number of years. And it's kind of difficult because everybody's projecting that aviation uh, is going to skyrocket. And um, we're still talking about electric aircraft and we're talking about hydrogen aircraft. And the panels I'd asked them to discuss whether or not this is realistic. I mean, when will we see a hydrogen aircraft pulling into Zaventem on a normal scheduled operation, Brussels to Rome? When will we see that? And also, I've got a question also for, for, for Neste, because we have Thorsten, the VP of Neste. When will the supply come? Because Karsten Spoor, I saw something or an interview or something, said that there's not enough of this stuff around to power his fleet for a day. So we need to wonder, where is the actual um, uh, the staff? When is this going to happen? And this is a big problem with everybody. Is it actually real? And will people generate it? And will it, will it come? So kind of just to wrap up, We've, we're very supportive of, your, of, of aviation here in Eurocontrol, and we try to be logical about it and support the staffs and support the businesses as well. But one thing we did last year that got us in a lot of trouble is we produced a paper, and it basically was querying whether or not raising taxes on aviation reduced CO2. And actually, we proved it didn't. You know, it's like raising taxes on cars. Has it stopped the cars? So I think something a little bit more incentivization is needed to lure people into different types of stuff. But I don't think taxing aviation actually delivers it. So Willie would have been in Montreal last week, and he was on the floor on the griddle, you know, and with 178 countries sitting around, and they're all talking about Corsia. And they can't agree on the time of day. And the reality is that it's very, very difficult to get anything done on, on a worldwide basis. So, you know, here in Europe, we have the Fit for 55. 
And that comes with a big bill. It's going to come with a big bill for all of the carriers in terms of purchasing their emissions and all of that kind of stuff. So this is something that like, we do here on a daily basis. We deliver it, all this kind of stuff. But it's a, a very difficult thing to, to tackle. So I'll be asking kind of like, you know, everybody to have a, have a look at that. So just to kind of wrap it up for you guys, where are we? Where is for next summer? Next summer doesn't look that good at the moment. Why? The carriers are all putting extra aircraft on. They have, we can see it from the deliveries, and we've discussed it with the main carriers. You know, we still think there'll be airspace closures. It's, it's, it's likely, and what I mean by that is the war is not likely to go away, we think, or the effect of the war by next summer. We're, please God, it might, but we don't think so. ACC strikes, just a reality. They're going to still be there. Hopefully that um, Oliver Yankovic is going to tell us whether the airports, our headman for airports in Europe, is actually going to operate at full tilt next year. And I'd be kind of confident that we would get a better outcome next year because we have a better lead in time. And of course, the uh, issues then is to make sure that everybody cooperates and runs the thing as a disciplined network. Now, I kind of want to wrap it up there because the whole idea really is to kind of generate, put a few topics on the table for today for the panels to discuss and to make sure that everybody kind of gets a kind of a broad global, the same facts and can operate off the same facts. You know, the, the big thing is if you're, if you're short of anything, you can throw out a few facts from here and we'll invent new facts for you if you give us a call later on and put them very glossy for you. So, so don't worry about that, okay? So guys, thanks for visiting us here in Brussels this morning. And I'm gonna hand over to um, Jacopo Prisinotti, our Master of Ceremonies today, to guide you through the rest. Grimila Magiv. Thank you, Eamon. It's been, a, it's been a really interesting, it's been a really interesting summer indeed. Uh, welcome everyone to the Eurocontrol Conference. Where to next for European aviation? Uh, we're gonna, of course, take the best lesson learned of 2022 to try really to improve and move this aviation forward. It's very good to see that there's a lot of people here in the room. Uh, we are learning that there's a lot of people also connected, which is great. We're gonna do our best to stimulate the best discussions. Some small housekeeping first. Please use the side doors at the end uh, if you want to exit and please mute your phones. Uh, it's gonna be a very interesting agenda. This morning we have two, uh, two main uh, speakers, uh, two keynote speakers and one very interesting panel. And our first guest speaker is Joseph Varadi. Joseph Varadi, of course, everybody knows him. He's the founder and CEO of Wizz Air, a company that you built yourself over a big effort of the last 20 years from nothing. Congratulations. And as you've seen from the, from the presentations before, while everybody was below 20% in 2019, you managed to go above 20% in 2019 with a big effort. So you're going to tell us how 22 went and what actions that we have to take to improve the situation. Joseph? Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, when uh, Eamon uh, contacted me to, uh, to take this uh, opportunity, he said that you, know, you, you might be a more palatable version of Michael O'Reilly, uh, who says all the time that everything is crap. I think he uses different words. Um, so I try to live up to his standards and expectations. Um, well, maybe I would just first uh, reflect on the image of air traffic management from an airline perspective in Europe at this point in time. Um, while I appreciate you know, all the efforts that you guys have been uh, making during the, uh, the summer, kind of leading the industry through a very difficult uh, period, recovering from COVID and uh, dealing with the uh, impacts of the war in, uh, in Ukraine. But the fact of the matter is that uh, really when you look at air traffic management in, uh, in Europe, you kind of come across with three things in your mind. Uh, one, uh, it is continuous labor shortage, uh, lack of controllers here or there. Two, strikes uh, here or there. Three, uh, they are overcharging the airlines. Um, and that's, I don't think, a good place uh, to be at. Uh, and, and we need to think about it. I mean, I heard in the presentation that uh, strikes uh, are a matter of, of reality. Uh, I don't think they should be a matter of reality. I, personally, I think, I, I, I just find it totally unacceptable that, uh, you know, kind of in the deepest crisis of the industry, uh, and the whole system, especially from a European perspective, affecting hundreds of thousands of people, uh, maybe millions of people. Uh, you know, French ATC decides to, uh, to go on strike, or previously, Italian ATC decides to, uh, to go on strike. Uh, I mean, I think uh, governments should be looking at this issue and should start taking uh, measures 
uh, how to contain such exposure uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the industry and millions of people. I mean, let's not forget all those people have been finally back into the franchise of flying. They are trying to spend money. Uh, they were locked down for two years, and they just want to get some more freedom out of their life. I mean, you could not just screw them uh, in that magnitude, hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of people, because you want to uh, pursue some selfish interest uh, here or there. So I think this should be reviewed, and that should be uh, uh, reinstated uh, on a totally different uh, platform. I think the industry is just too much exposed to this uh, blackmailing and, and negative uh, impacts. And not only the industry players like airlines, but more importantly, probably the, uh, uh, the hundreds of thousands of consumers, travelers, uh, who, by the way, are also voters uh, for governments and the, uh, and the bigger you know, European system. Well, the other um, reflection is uh, regarding labor, labor shortage. Personally, I think the industry got it completely wrong uh, in terms of uh, recovery. We, we were one of the, the very few airlines uh, started barking already in January, February, uh, saying that the recovery is going to be a lot quicker than uh, what we think. Because what we experienced, um, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, that the moment governments lifted uh, COVID restrictions, uh, demand immediately came back. Uh, so people uh, like changed their mind immediately. They felt that now this is time to move. This is the freedom back, and we should be acting on, on that. And demand for travel uh, you know, surged pretty much overnight after lifting those restrictions. And this is exactly what we are seeing. Yes, I mean, Asia is down because of the still prevailing uh, COVID restrictions uh, in, those, uh, in those countries. But from a European perspective, I think the market is, is, is wide open uh, with that regard, and demand is back. Even I would say the demand has been surpassing uh, uh, previous levels. And indeed, as you said, uh, uh, Viser is uh, operating a lot higher uh, capacity level today than uh, prior to the, uh, to the pandemic. Um, uh, we are a 30 40% bigger airline today than in, in, two, so in early t uh, 2020. I mean, maybe just for you to understand, um, we are operating a fleet of 168 uh, aircraft at the moment. Actually, we added uh, 50 aircraft uh, to, the, uh, to the airline uh, during the pandemic since March uh, 2020. Uh, so we have been growing during the pandemic, and indeed we are the fastest growing airline in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, this year we're going to be carrying well over 50 million uh, uh, passengers across uh, 52 countries where we are operating to, which is the largest geographical footprint of any local carriers in the, uh, uh, in, in the world. Uh, so we have been pushing the lines, and we, we are able to do that uh, because we have invested into our system, and we have been prepared to carry uh, some um, inefficiencies in the system. So we have been overstuffing, uh, essentially, airline uh, during certain periods when we were grounding quite a significant portion of the, uh, of the fleet for the benefit of the times uh, when demand is back and the market is unconstrained uh, to be able to operate uh, the, uh, uh, the intended uh, capacity. So I think we have to be careful with uh, how we are managing uh, all these cycles. Uh, if we take too much resources out of the system, it's just pretty much impossible to, uh, to reinstall those resources. Uh, it's not only that people get rusty, uh, but, uh, uh, but also uh, we're gonna be, you're going to be missing headcount. And if you look at the, the training cycle in, uh, in air traffic management, I mean, we are talking about years, so it's not going to be easy to recover. Uh, maybe that's easier on the airport side or the, uh, the airline side, uh, but it is a significant challenge. And I think we have to be smart uh, with regard to the long-term views of the industry and how we are resourcing um, uh, assets and labor against uh, uh, those, uh, those views. Personally, I think aviation will continue to, um, uh, to prosper. Uh, people will, uh, will travel, will fly even more. Uh, I think uh, GDP will continue to enhance over the long run. Uh, that will translate into more disposable income, uh, more discretionary spending of the consumers. Uh, so on that basis, uh, I, I think this industry will just keep growing. Um, I mean, you can debate the, uh, the magnitude of growth, but certainly this is a growing industry, and I think we need to take a long-term view when it comes to resourcing the industry, uh, each segment, not only on the airline side, but also uh, certainly on air traffic uh, uh, management. And, and the third reflection on what is going on at the moment is, uh, is the charging system. We continue to believe, uh, from an airline perspective, that uh, uh, air traffic management is abusing its monopoly. Uh, you are a state monopoly, so pretty much you do what you want, uh, and you are doing that. 
um, and you are uh, putting the financial burden on the, uh, on the industry, on the airlines. If you look at poor airlines, and I'm, I'm not here to, uh, to really cry and, 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 and complain, but essentially the airline sector is taking uh, all the problems. It takes the problems uh, with the consumers, we are regulated on how to deal with passengers, should they be long delayed or cancelled. Uh, we are taking all the supply chain issues, be it ATC, be it aircraft deliveries, uh, whatever it is. So we are on the kind of the wrong end of the spectrum. And it is because we are the most fragmented uh, sector in the whole value chain as a result. We have to deal with all the, uh, uh, all the problems. But at the same time, I think we have to look at aviation as an ecosystem. And everyone needs to be identified for its place, uh, how to best play into the uh, ecosystem. And I can tell you that... Uh, if only the airline uh, is trying to be efficient uh, economically and operationally, uh, but other stakeholders are not motivated to do the same, and they can just push you know, the cost up as they, as they wish, that's not going to work. And I don't think it's fair and equitable. So we really need to think of how to uh, incent air traffic management for efficiency as opposed to just pushing the cost through the system and upcharge the, uh, the customers, the, uh, the airlines. Um, Maybe just to address a few kind of uh, longer term challenges uh, going forward. I think the industry is, uh, is facing at least uh, three major challenges in the next uh, period, maybe the next decade or, or beyond. Uh, certainly we are um, up against uh, operational integrity. I don't think the industry as discussed is at the right place at the moment. Uh, the whole supply chain is problematic. Uh, from top to bottom and from left to right. Uh, it's not only air traffic management, it's not only airlines, but I will just give you an example, you know, how things are translating into, um, you know, issues uh, in the end uh, to the consumer. Uh, secondly, we have this carbon challenge, the decarbonization uh, challenge of the uh, industry. Sustainability, as uh, Amos said, you have to use this word uh, nowadays. But indeed, I think it is a challenge. Uh, uh, and it is a challenge not necessarily because uh, it comes inherently uh, from the industry and self-imposed by the industry, but because the environment is going to force us to, uh, uh, to address it. The consumer is going to do that, uh, the investor is going to do that, I think politics will do it, uh, and all the stakeholders around us will push us to, uh, to do that, whether we like it or not, it, this is something to be, uh, to be addressed. And thirdly, I think we have the uh, kind of the regulatory challenge, how uh, this industry should be regulated for the long run, uh, how to play it fair and equitably, uh, how to play uh, level, uh, uh, level playing field, uh, etc. So let me, uh, let me start with the operational side. And I would just like to give you an example uh, how Vizair has been affected uh, by the dysfunctioning of the supply chain, uh, be it uh, air traffic management, uh, or airport operations, lack of airport security, lack of uh, ground handling stuff. So we are an ultra-locus carrier uh, by definition, which really means that uh, we have a very skewed model, operating model towards uh, maximizing efficiencies coming out of the, uh, the system in terms of aircraft utilization, in terms of crew productivity, to make sure that we really fly the aircraft. We tend to fly the aircraft 12 and a half, 13 hours a day on average, uh, across the year, across the whole fleet, uh, which is far above the, um, uh, the industry average, which is roughly around 10, 10 plus uh, hours. Uh, and we want to get productivity out of, out of the cruise, close to 900 hours. This is the regulated level in the industry versus the industry average of around 700, 750 uh, 50 hours. The problem we have is that when you have the ecosystem kind of dysfunctioning, uh, it is just impossible to do that. So imagine like we are rostering crews for flying um, 10 hours and 55 minutes when the legal limit is 11 hours. Uh, this is almost like guaranteed that something is going to go wrong during the day. Uh, the, um, uh, the aircraft is going to be delayed and the schedule is going to be delayed. And as a result, we're going to be ending up in the heads of the pilots uh, to exercise uh, pilot discretion to do another hour of flying or even you go beyond that and we have no choice but to cancel the, um, uh, the flight. Uh, and this is, this is the problem, that uh, simply the current operation of the supply chain in aviation in Europe does not support efficiency, certainly not airline efficiency. And as a result, uh, we are now redesigning the, uh, the operating model to make sure that we build in 
more resilience, more slacks in the system, so we're going to be losing some efficiency. We try to regain it, regain it uh, otherwise, so not optimizing for the day, but optimizing for the months uh, to make sure that we, we, we remain as ultra low cost as, uh, as possible. But that basically, uh, this dysfunctional operation of the supply chain uh, challenges the entire operating model of an airline, like our model. Maybe Ryanair is a little bit ahead of us, uh, because they have been adopting their model um, uh, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat early, earlier, going through similar uh, challenges. Um, we are closing the gap now, so I think what you saw on the, uh, the cancellation rate, we should be coming down dramatically on, uh, on that to, uh, uh, to play uh, properly. But this is a significant change in the, uh, in the industry. And that's how all these operational unintegrity of the supply chain is sort of flowing through the system and affecting uh, the airlines and affecting the consumers uh, in the end. I think the last thing what you want to do or you want to end up with is to cancel the consumer, um, uh, those people who gave their trust and money uh, to you, and OK, they are back again to uh, fly in the, uh, in the franchise of, uh, of aviation. So we need, to, we need to reinstate operational integrity. And I think every layer in the, um, in the supply chain um, needs to address uh, what, uh, what needs to be done, be it an airport, be it air traffic management, be it an airline. Uh, I don't think we can operate this industry as uh, we've just operated throughout the summer. Yes, I think we kind of survived summer. I, maybe that's a better term. We, we somehow survived summer, but it was not great. It was not great, and it should not be happening again. And we have to... Uh, look at the operating model, we have, we have to look at the, the, the needs for efficiency and how to address those, and we have to uh, put appropriate resources in the system to, uh, uh, to deal with the, uh, the challenges. I, just, I think the, the next um, uh, bigger issue is, is decarbonization and sustainability, and, uh, and as said, whether we like it or not, I think this has to be addressed by the, uh, uh, by the industry. We are probably in a good position because by default, um, uh, being very efficient, we are also the most sustainable airline. We have the lowest carbon footprint. Um, last month, we, uh, uh, we flew 55 um, uh, grams of uh, carbon uh, dioxide per, per square, uh, square mile, uh, which is the lowest in the industry in, um, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, today, we are operating a fleet of aircraft with average age of five years. Uh, and given the innovation and the, all the new aircraft deliveries, that will go down to three years within five years. So we're going to be very efficient technology-wise and very low carbon footprint relative to the rest of the industry. But we also have to be real uh, as industry. I mean, you know, you see all these uh, uh, greenwashing uh, initiatives that, you know, we, we fly the... Uh, uh, the 25-year-old small airplane during the weekend, we plant two trees over the weekend and we are done in terms of our responsibility for sustainability. That just cannot be the way. I think it has to be real. Uh, it has to be addressed through technology for the long run. Uh, and I'm not an engineer. Um, I don't know how hydrogen is going to play out. It seems to me that hydrogen might be the, the long-term solution. I doubt it is electric. Um, I think electric has a lot more contained um, uh, prospect than hydrogen, but I think there is a lot to be done there, uh, and hopefully uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is something which, which will be happening. And we are part of it. We are uh, on a pilot project with Airbus uh, to try to support that technological development from the perspective of the, uh, of the operator. And in between that point, because maybe we are talking about uh, 2035, 2040, and now um, we, we have to look at uh, what the industry can do to, uh, to lower its, uh, its impact. But I can tell you that should the visa operating model with the visa aircraft be implemented across the whole of Europe, the carbon footprint of the industry would come down by a third. So this industry would be emitting 35% uh, less carbon than what it is emitting today. So this is not only technology, this is not only SAF, uh, but it is also the way how airlines are operating, what they are flying today, and what operating model they are putting in place. So when you are flying hub and spoke, uh, the likes of Air France, Lufthansa, et cetera, then your impact, carbon impact, is going to be a lot greater than flying point to point, especially when you are talking about intra-European flying. I think long haul is slightly uh, different. Um, when you are operating business class, uh, you are just so efficient in terms of uh, a seat per carbon or carbon per, uh, per seat that uh, a business class traveler is, is, is making a much greater um, impact on the environment and an economy class uh, um, uh, traveler. So I think you can also look into the models, uh, how airlines are operating, 
uh, in the industry and how they translate into carbon uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. We're going to be in the forefront of that development. I think we are in good position again because of the technology what we, uh, what we use. And, 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 and we're going to be forced as an industry uh, to step change and transition ourselves from carbon to a decarbonized technology in any event, whether we like it or not. So we, we better come to the forefront of that uh, process. And thirdly, and, and lastly, uh, I would say that we have this regulatory challenge. Um, this is a bit of an elephant in the room. Um, you know, we kind of like talking about the uh, interest of the industry, the whole ecosystem, uh, the interest of the airline sector. But the fact of the matter is that there is a breaking line uh, between uh, kind of old generation airlines uh, and the new generation airlines. The old money versus the, well, and the new money. Well, that, that, that has never been old money because those airlines have never really made any, any money on a structural basis, but that is new money. Uh, so there is efficiency in the industry and there are airlines who actually can create value uh, for shareholders, can create value for stakeholders uh, a lot better way than the, uh, than, than the old airlines. Um, and, and the problem is that uh, regulation uh, has been largely skewed towards the interest uh, of, the, of the incumbent uh, carriers, the legacy carriers, if you want to use that term, uh, versus the up-and-coming new generation uh, carriers. Um, and, and the discussion going on in the regulatory uh, sphere is uh, sort of suggesting that that line will continue to, uh, to, to happen. When we are talking about, let's say, uh, carbon tax or some kind of a regulation that, uh, or financial burden that would be put on um, intra-European flying, but long haul would be exempt and cargo would be exempt. I think that's a complete nonsense if you really think about this. So are we here to protect the airspace uh, and the cleanness of, of the air uh, of Europe? Uh, are we really serious about sustainability for Europe? And how can you exempt more than half of the flights uh, on, that, on that basis. So I think this is just a joke, and again, this is a distorting level playing field, and the regulator, uh, I think the EU governments, uh, whoever regulate the industry, need to look into this uh, and, and play it on a fair and equitable uh, basis. And I don't think we are there at the moment, and we are nowhere near to it. I mean, just look at what happened during the, uh, uh, during the COVID times. Uh, the two airline groups that received the most state aid um, are Air France KLM and Lufthansa, uh, not the new generation airlines. And these two airlines uh, didn't get uh, that financial aid because they were the best airline in, in Europe. Uh, they were not the best airline in economic performance, they are not the best airline in, in consumer performance, and they are not the best airline in environmental performance either. But they got the financial support, so why is that? Uh, so I would really challenge the governments and all decision makers and regulators to look at the regulatory framework as such how to play it fairly and equitably across the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for all your very interesting and challenging views. First of all, on the two short-term points, especially on the strike issue, uh, the, the point is really important, looking at next summer especially, looking at the overflights, uh, we have experienced very negative uh, situation this year. So we really urge the states to act very quickly. On the second point regarding the labor and, uh, and, the, and the staff needed for, for, for preparing very well the performance of the summer, again, here in Eurocontrol, we're working hard already now to prepare next year. And the issue is really that one single point of failure is a point of failure for the network. It can, we cannot afford that. We've been experiencing that. So these two points are really valid and are part of our priorities in Eurocontrol to support aviation better next year. Now, I think on the three major points, and I think it's going to be well preparing the European aviation uh, debate for 2030, 2035, the, the panel which is coming up, on the operational integrity, what we call the single value chain on the decarbonization challenge and on the regulatory challenge. I think those are the mid-strategic terms that we really need to address. So I would like to invite Kathy Buick here. Kathy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so Kathy is a very well-known aviation editor and journalist. All of you know her. And she will be moderating our two panels of today, starting with today, European Aviation 2030-2035, yes. where we're okay. going to go. Thank you very much, Jacobo. 
So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, we have, you know, uh, I promised, first of all, I promised the organizers I would secure and uh, deliver a perfect, flawless, on-time performance and avoid what we have been had too much in the system lately, delays. So we have 50 minutes to explore how the European aviation system will evolve over the next 10, 15 years. How will the unprecedented series of adversities, which we're all seeing right now in the system, will it prompt a change of the business models, uh, fleet portfolios, the role of regulators? So we have 50 minutes, no time to lose. So I would like to invite to join me on the stage, Lynn Ambleton, you know, Angus Kelly and Willie Walsh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hi, hello, very welcome, thank you. Hi, Lynn, you know, whatever, it's fine, you know. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, the video, the opening video was a little gloomy, but obviously the system is working well. You all managed to fly in. Dublin, Dublin, Geneva, maybe Montreal, Willie? I no, Geneva. Geneva, so there we are. So um, I'm sure there's no need to... Uh, to do this, but for the audience online and in the room, I'm quickly going to go and present you. Um, Lynn, ladies first, Lynn Ambleton. She is chief executive of Aer Lingus and uh, a member of the management committee of IAG. That's the holding you belong to next to British Airways, Iberia Vueling, maybe I forget a couple of airlines, you know. Angus Kelly, you know, executive director and chief executive of Air Cup world's largest lesser of commercial aircraft, and then Willie Walsh, you know, Director General of IATA, the largest trade association for airlines. You know. So once again, thank you for being here. I would like to start off with asking you two very simple questions. You know, if you can answer them not too long, because yes, I'm sorry, 50 minutes. Um, what do you think the European system will look like by 2030 in terms of volume of demand and capacity. And will people still fly here in Europe? You know, we have flight shaming, expensive tickets, and so on. So... Without doubt, there'll be a lot more people flying in 2030 than today. That's a given. Every 15 years, the amount of people traveling doubles. And it's not just all driven by emerging markets. We will continue to see significant growth in European aviation. Um, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever about that. Um, we're leasing airplanes into 2025 now to European carriers. So I have no doubt about that. OK, good. Lynn? Well, absolutely confident that people are going to want to fly, <coughs> without a doubt. And you just saw how much uh, travel bounced back after COVID. Um, people want to fly. Economies will still grow. People will want to visit friends uh, and have life experiences. No doubt about that. I think the, there are two, two caveats, uh, which is we need to get, as an industry, the environmental credentials clear so that it's, it's, it's OK to fly. Um, and, and then there's the cost side of it. So if the costs in the system uh, uh, increase too much, that will, in, in effect, be passed on to prices, and that could could um, impact demand. Um, but yeah, people will want to fly and this industry is going to grow for sure. Um, on the supply side, uh, we need aeroplanes. And we've, uh, a lot of aeroplanes were taken out of the system during COVID. Um, but we need functioning airports and we need functioning air traffic control. And if we don't have all of that, then that might actually curtail the amount of growth that the industry is able to do. But the potential is there for sure. Okay, Willie? Yeah, um, if, if we look at where we are today, in terms of passenger traffic within Europe, we're at about 88% of where we were in 2019. Um, mm -hmm. We estimate that uh, I added, we'll get back to 2019 levels of passenger numbers in Europe by 2024. And uh, we expect growth to continue to be at around 3% per annum after that. So 2030, it should be 20% larger than it uh, it, it, it was, um, you know, we have some ground to make up. Uh, I think the good news is that supply and demand, with, certainly within Europe, 
very well matched. Uh, we're seeing seed factors even in this period around 90% uh, within Europe. So we're back to you know, very efficient levels of seed factors. And I expect that to continue, but I think uh, Lynn has said it. You know, the assumption is that the air navigation system will function and that airports will be able to address the uh, challenges that we've seen uh, this summer, uh, which have clearly had a big impact on the pace of recovery in Europe. Okay, you know, so all very positive outlook, you know, one would expect for the industry. Lynn, you touched upon it already, you know, the sustainability, the environmental sustainability. So it's a mega trend. I don't think we can get around it, at least not in Europe. So how strong is the pressure from your airlines and your corporate uh, customers on your, you know, carbon footprint? Do they ask you how much CO2 your aircraft emit? Do they say, um, question how you calculate the CO2 emissions? Because that seems to be a new business and topic. Um, do they comment on your fleet? Do they say, I'm sorry, you still operate 330 CO's, please change them by NEOs or even 350s? Or, you know, how, how much is that pressure? So for sure, there are some customers, some particularly corporates, uh, both on the passenger side and the cargo side. Um, where the CO2 uh, is already in focus um, to all the things you've said. Uh, you know, what's the level of carbon emissions? How is it calculated? Um, and there's transparency there. Generally speaking, I think um, the airlines effectively are ahead of the customers in terms of thinking about decarbonisation. Um, IOG was one of the first groups to come out with commitments to decarbonising um, uh, commitment to you know, 2050 net zero, because we just see it as fundamental to this industry thriving. So um, we're thinking about aeroplanes, we're thinking about um, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, and, and we're looking at uh, all of the efficiencies that will bring down carbon. But I think customers will start asking more um, questions and be more demanding. Um, but at the moment, I think it's more top of our mind rather than top of customers' minds. Willie, you know. Yeah, yeah um, you know, it, it is a very important issue. How we calculate it is very important. Uh, at IATA, we've uh, introduced a, uh, a, a new methodology to calculate it because what we felt was that when we looked at all of the carbon calculators that were out there, they were grossly inaccurate. Um, you know, some overstated, some understated. So what we've tried to do is to get an accurate measure based on the actual performance of the aircraft, the actual uh, passenger capacity in the aircraft, the cargo carried, so that people can have a better assessment of what the individual contribution they're making to uh, CO2 is. And, you know, Joseph touched on it, the difference between your uh, contribution if you're flying in a business class seat or in an economy seat. And I think these are factors that uh, are important to measure. You know, if, if I look at my own experience, the first time I was ever asked a question about uh, CO2 was in 2005. Uh, prior to that, nobody had ever asked me a question about it. And I'd say between 2005 and 2015, there were very, very few questions being asked of me as a CEO in relation to uh, CO2 and carbon footprint. I think it has changed significantly in the last five, six, seven years. Greater awareness, greater interest in it, greater appreciation for the need to do something about it, and that is going to intensify as we go forward. So without question, you know, the industry has to continue to not just do good things in relation to reducing our impact on the environment, but we need to make sure that people understand what it is we're doing. Uh, because I think that is a fair criticism of the industry, that we haven't been vocal enough in terms of telling people what we're doing and what we intend to do. Uh, but I'm very confident uh, the industry has committed to net zero in 2050. Uh, it will be tough to get there, but without question we will get there. Uh, it is going to cost a lot of money, and the transition from where we are today to 2050 it's going to be tough and it's going to be expensive and it will be reflected in ticket prices. Without question, prices you know, will increase as a result of the challenge to decarbonise the industry. Yeah. Angus, how important is this sustainability issue for you? Are you saying 
yeah, okay, the concerns for climate change is there, yeah, that other people will continue to fly anyhow. I see good demand, as you said, going forward and for aircraft. So, how people, do you see this? What do you do? So you mentioned the aircraft. Mm -hmm. There's just, as Al Gore says, the inconvenient truth, which people just have to say. Today, there's about 23,500 large commercial aircraft in the world. That's it. 70% of those aircraft are currently using technology from the 1990s, your A330s, your 737s. Less than 30% of today's fleet has the new technology engines on board that burn less fuel. Boeing and Airbus, on a good day, on a really good day, could probably make 2,000 airplanes a year. But we're a long way from that happening. Boeing has plenty of issues, Airbus has plenty of issues, the engine manufacturers have lots of issues in producing engines and keeping the existing engines flying. So we are n if, if anyone thinks that this industry can transition into the most fuel efficient form of aircraft that are currently available by the end of this decade, they are wrong. That will not happen. So start with that. Then what can we do to enhance uh, the position of the industry. Could we cut 10 minutes off the average stage length of a flight over the next five years? Is that possible in air traffic control in Europe? That alone will make a very significant difference to fuel burn. That comes back to looking at stuff that's closer to home, maybe a bit more painful to tackle. These grand um, aspirations of we will use SAF fuel for 30% of our fleet. By the, that's not going to happen. That's more pie in the sky, political nonsense. No one's going to put that money to work. Not a chance in today's world. I disagree. 30% by the end of 2030, well, it's not going to happen that the European governments will subsidize SAF to the extent it needs. It currently costs yeah, a it's not a, it's, it, you know, This is a global debate, and it's not about Europe. If you look at what the US is doing, they're definitely, but it's, but it's a global definitely much more ambitious. They, they may be, but I'm just saying the quantum, of, uh, the quantum of investment required by the states to do it is extraordinary. When we look at the current cost to SAF to subsidize that, to build it, what's required. But okay, leave, leave that aside um, on the SAF for a minute. I think that we have to look closer to home and say, you know, we mention strikes are inevitability every summer. Why is that the case? Why is that allowed? These are much harder questions to answer. Um, when it comes to air traffic control, uh, managing the airports. But there's unions to be tackled in that regard. There's consolidation of the airline business will make things a lot more efficient too. Um, that's where the European Commission has to look and say, are we willing to build global champions in Europe anymore? Or are we just happy slipping into mediocrity? Are we willing to do what needs to be taken here to build airlines that can take on the American giants? You know, today, um, if Airbus had to be built today, I doubt it would happen. But Europe built a company that was able to take on the American giants of McDonnell, Douglas, and Boeing, and beat them for that matter. There was a political will to do it, to bring together what can be done when we come together. But you know, these are the things we have to look at, I believe, rather than these goals of we want everyone to fly new generation aircraft in the next five years. That just simply won't happen. Um, so that's, that's my view. Okay, well, since, since you're touching about that and you're buying a lot of aircraft, you are saying here that, you know, the two big, you know, OEMs are not really putting enough effort in trying no, to... No, it's not that. They're trying no. everything they can. They're commercially they? driven for businesses. But you just can't build airplanes. I mean, you can't take a barista out of Starbucks and say, start building engines. You know, you, these are highly trained um, mechanical engineers that are required to do it. Uh, the supply chain that's required behind it, the infrastructure to expand an aircraft manufacturing facility is enormous. So that's not going to happen either. Uh, at best, um, they, will, they will probably get, I suspect, 90% of their production targets. They're not going to get to 100%, I don't believe. And um, even if they got to 100%, we still wouldn't replace the existing fleet of aircraft with new technology by the end of the decade. So we have to look elsewhere. Okay. Well, but, but the important thing, and I, I agree with uh, Angus on quite a lot of what he said there, is there's not much point in having the most efficient aircraft if it's been operated in an mm -hmm. inefficient manner. 
you know, so let's deal with the structural inefficiency so that we can maximize the efficiency of the aircraft that are flying today. You know, so let's talk about single European sky. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think we'll ever see it. Um, I would agree with you. But, <laughs> but it's a disgrace. Yeah. It's a disgrace. Yeah. You know, like, let's, let's call it for what it is. It is a scandal. Yeah. You know, we will be lectured as an industry by politicians who will say we have to improve our performance. And the same politicians will do nothing to address the structural inefficiency that exists in Europe because the political will isn't there. The technology is there. Uh, you know, airlines have uh, already invested in the technology to enable them to fly their aircraft much more efficiently than we're able to do so. So, you know, if, if we're genuine about addressing this challenge on sustainability, we have to address every aspect of it. Uh, because we know today that, uh, you know, 10 to 12% of CO2 could be avoided in Europe if we had uh, a more efficient uh, ANSP structure um, in Europe. And, and there's nothing stopping that other than political will. Yeah, but then we should be more vocal on a different level about that. You know, we, that's what I'm saying. That? We should call it out all the time. Yeah. You know, when people tell us as an industry that we have to improve, we've got to tell these people, you can make a big difference. Yeah. You know, it's crazy to think that we're still operating aircraft today the way we were in the 70s. We're still flying the aircraft in, in effect in the same manner as we did in the 70s and 80s, when the technology on board the aircraft today is so much more efficient. And we saw that, you know, one of the, uh, I think there were several positives uh, out of the pandemic, but when we were able to operate the aircraft efficiently, because there were fewer aircraft flying, you know, then we were able to really measure the, the difference uh, an efficient system would have. So we, we have got to tackle these issues. It's uh, just too important. We can't ignore it. So, you know, whether we call it the single European sky or whether we call it get off your arse and sort out this inefficiency, <laughs> you know, it needs to be done. Yeah. So and, and just to just go in, to, to get to net zero, you know, we need all of these things to happen. So we, we need Airbus and Boeing to be uh, manufacturing the next gen aircraft, but that in itself is not going to solve things. We need to take all of these opportunities on efficiencies uh, in how we're operating the aircraft. But we also do need SAF to be developed. Um, the technology's there. Um, as Willie said, the US is way ahead in terms of incentives and recognising the need to ramp up production. But that has to happen, and that needs a level of coordination between industry, governments, that we've never seen before. But we have to step up and get that, and get that moving. And of course... Um, verified carbon offset um, will play a role in, in the industry decarbonising. But all of these things have to come together and it needs a level of political will, um, industry pressure, um, and all of the players in the system uh, playing their part. Speaking about political will, Willie, you were in Montreal. So how, how did that go there? You know, on Corsia, long-term aspirational goals. The industry is committed but as we just mentioned, without the politicians there, we are well, not I, advancing enough. Yeah, I, I think we're going in the right direction. You know, we're taking small steps. Now, we should be taking much bigger steps and we should be moving much faster. But, you know, I think we have to, on this issue, I think we have to look at the positives. And the, the positive is everybody is aligned, well, pretty much everybody is aligned and heading in the right direction. And, uh, you know, we were... At, at IATA, we were saying, you know, if, if ICAO cannot agree a long-term aspirational goal, well, then this assembly will have been a failure. You know, the, the most important thing out of this assembly was to agree on a long-term aspirational goal. Now, even the title, you know, long-term aspirational goal, is underwhelming. But the good thing is, you know, the industry already has come together and say, well, we're going to achieve net zero in 2050. And personally... I, I think actually we'll do it ahead of that because I think the pressure will come on uh, to do it ahead of that. Now, how do we do it? It's going to be expensive. I think sustainable aviation fuels are going to be the key in the period between now and 2050. In the period between maybe 2040 and 2050 and beyond, then I think you'll see new technology. I think hydrogen uh, becomes more of a factor. I agree with uh, Joseph in his opening remarks. I think electric hybrid electric is really going to address a very small segment uh, you know, it will play a part. And as Lynn says, you need all of these individual pieces to help get to the, uh, the goal of net zero. And, and beyond 2050, it won't be net zero. You know, we'll be heading towards, uh, you know, zero carbon, which a few years ago we laughed about. 
Um, but I think you know there is a, a move in that direction, and I think we can be confident that we, you know, that we will make changes. But we've got to start taking action now. And I think the real positive is that despite the biggest financial crisis the industry has ever gone through, airlines are still investing in sustainability. So in 2021, when you know, the industry will have lost 50 billion, uh, every single drop of sustainable aviation fuel that was produced was used. And that was at a price that is about three times the price of uh, jet kerosene. So despite the huge price premium, Airlines continued to spend money and invest in uh, technology through that period. So I, I think there is very clear evidence of the commitment to do this. Uh, but as Lynn said and as Inga said, it, it will require everybody working together to ensure that we can actually achieve the target. Well, Angus, are you buying, planning to buy regional hybrid electric aircraft? No, no, no. Too small you won't be for a big boy them. like. No, no, it's not, no, not, not at all. It's. Um, the challenge is at the moment you're looking at four-seaters with a pilot. So you have three passengers and a pilot. It's very hard to see how you could ever make money out of that. Also, the question, will they ever be allowed land airside? Do they have to land outside the airport if they're bringing people to an airport? The concept of saying, I'm going to pick up passengers at the top of a skyscraper in London or Sao Paulo, no way. The owners of those skyscrapers will never let random people into their building to go up to the top floor and pick up a... So we're talking the EV talk Correct, here. yeah. So I think yeah. that's, that's probably unlikely. Um, so the, what, what you may see is, w will we see some form of battery um, when aircraft are taxiing for auxiliary power units? Perhaps, but the main engine, that will be hydrocarbons for a long, long time to come. And what we also know is that the engine manufacturers today, because they're the drivers of it, it's not the airframe, mm -hmm. really, it's the engine manufacturers, what technology do they have? So their next generation of engine technology, which would probably come into service in 2035 and beyond, is being developed now. But that technology is focused on the reduction in the consumption of gas, of fuel. No one at the moment is investing or building an engine for an aircraft that will come into service before 2045 using anything other than Jet A1 or SAF, which is a derivative of the same. So the, I, I agree the hydrogen may come along at some point in the future, but today if you were to try and do hydrogen, um, the tank could be bigger than the fuselage of the aircraft. Uh, so we will get there at some point, no doubt, on the technology will come in hydrogen or, or electric maybe, but it's a long, long way off. As Willie said, you know, we'll be getting close to 2050 uh, before we get there. We know that today because, as I said, the only people who can build the engines, um, there's only three companies in the world who can do it. This isn't like iPhones where it can be disrupted overnight. The, mm -hmm. the requirements to be able to build an engine to send humans um, 40,000 feet in the air is extremely difficult. The regulations, the safety to go through it takes, takes decades and decades. So um, we, we'll, uh, we know that now. And again, that's, you know, again, an, an inconvenient truth of the industry. Uh, no engine manufacturer is currently working on any engine that will come into service before 2040 on a large commercial aircraft other than one that burns Jet A1. So, you know, look, um, that's what we're going to buy. We're the yep. biggest owner of aircraft in the world. We're the biggest buyer of aircraft, the biggest buyer of engines and of helicopters, for that matter. Um, and none of them do we see uh, at any time, I hope in my work, I don't think in my working life where, um, and it should be working for a few more decades, where we're going to see <laughs> um, anything other than Jet A1 being the main source of propulsion or a derivative of it, as Willie says, on the SAF front. Yeah. To come back to what you mentioned about the EV tolls. So... Hype for you, you know, because one of your competitors is ordering a couple of them uh, many for of a them potential are. market. Uh, no, so. many are looking at the, the EVITALs, and I think at some point you'll get something that may work. The four-seater, I, I don't see that, particularly with a pilot on board. I don't see it getting certified without a pilot on board. Um, so you'll have to get to some kind of scale. Because you've got to think, a pilot is going to get paid, but they're, they're going to get paid a lot of money. Um, an Evital, it's a battery, where do you charge all these things? They're big units as well, you can't just, you, you don't want one of these things landing outside your front garden, you don't want that. 
Um, so, I so I think there, there, there's plenty of challenges yet, but look, we have to start somewhere. I do think the EBITALs have a role to play, but it may not be um, transferring uh, human cargo. It could be, you know, we're transferring okay. other types of cargo. That may be where there is um, a role for them to replace vans and stuff like that on the road. Um, for sure, there, there, are some, there are some utility for them, but not necessarily, I don't think, for passengers anytime soon. Okay. And, and if, if, you, if you look at it from a sustainability point of view, and Eurocontrol has done excellent research in this area, uh, you know, so uh, I think there have been two papers now produced by Eurocontrol. Uh, but if you eliminated all flying in Europe of less than 500 kilometers, so every single one, assuming you could, you would stop 24% of the flights, but it would reduce the CO2 by 3.8%. So, you know, and that's assuming all flights under 500 kilometers. So electric, hybrid, electric will play a very, very small part. It's, it's not going to be zero, but it will be a very, very small part. And that's why we've got to look at the data, which clearly demonstrates that the challenge here is uh, long haul. Flights of greater than 1,500 kilometers, typically 80% of the CO2 produced by the industry uh, is mm -hmm. uh, greater than 1,500 kilometers. We're not going to see an electric aircraft that will be capable of operating those flights. I, I, I'm not sure if we'll ever see one, but certainly not in the period out to 2050. No. No. But we could have one for short haul flights. You know, Lynn, you know, when you um, talk about regional, or when you look at, you know, Aer Lingus Regional with the supplier of that, you know, the airline, do you put sustainability demands down? Do you say, okay, you know, I would like you to go in that direction? Concretely, what do you discuss with them, you know, well, in terms we, of sustainability? We've got the same, um, we've got the same commitment with our uh, Aer Lingus Regional partner in terms of, getting to net zero. Um, I agree with the comments that have been made about the technology and the pace of the technology. Um, uh, and this is where sustainable aviation fuels and, and other aspects of the policy all come in. Um, uh, eventually, it, it will be easier to decarbonize short flights than, than longer yeah, flights. Yeah. Um, so that in that regard, they've got the head start. Um, but uh, same challenges remain. Okay. To, to change the subject and to talk about something that keeps us all up at night, at least it keeps me up at night, you know, what's happening in Russia. Um, I think in um, uh, Montreal, you know, the ICAO could do what lots of other uh, UN bodies could not do. Russia was ousted, to use not a diplomatic term, from the ICAO Council. Now, will, he, will you follow suit on that? You know, you have several Russian carriers in your membership. I think their IOSA certification is under review and has been suspended. So technically, they should no longer be a member of IATA. So if we're a carrier uh, no longer has IOSA uh, registration, if they have not complied with the uh, IOSA audit, then they, they can't be a member. And they would, their membership would be suspended, and that's actually what we do. Uh, so where somebody uh, no longer holds the IOSA uh, uh, registration, they are suspended from membership. If there's clear that they're not going to even try and get uh, recertification, well, then typically they're excluded from membership of the uh, the association. Look, we have well, to the registry is suspended, so they should not be a member anymore. It's, it's their, yeah. their membership would be suspended, so that, ah, that doesn't mean they're they're necessarily kicked out of the association. Okay. Uh, I think what we have to be clear on is, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody condemns what's happening in Ukraine and the, the, the Russian ad, ad, attack and war in Ukraine. It's terrible. We want to see it finished. We want to see it ended. I'm sure everybody wants to see a return to some form of normality. You know, Eamon showed the chart there of uh, flights through Russian airspace, you know, which is a, a critical path of Europe to Asia traffic. Now, today, uh, traffic between Europe and Asia in terms of passenger uh, numbers is still less than 40% of where we were in 2019, principally because China is closed. Uh, so it's not having a big impact on the industry today. For some airlines, it's having a huge impact. Finnair, for example, uh, you know, who've had to restructure the network completely. Uh, so we want to see things move. We want to see peace in Ukraine. We want to see this war ended, and we want to see the industry getting back to some sense of uh, normality. So, you know, we have not kicked the Russian carriers out of uh, the association, where uh, in the case of uh, one carrier, they were um, sanctioned, uh, and their CEO was on the board of IATA. We removed that individual from okay. the board of IATA. 
I guess you knew the question was coming. Mm -hmm. You know, Russia has not been very good for you. They stole, what, 110, uh, 120 aircraft from you. So an expensive lesson, but a dangerous president. Um, how do you protect yourself to something like that happen again? You know? You know, we're, we're in every, nearly every major, every, like every country in the world that has an airline, we're there. Um, and uh, while it is a large number of airplanes to have, we had 140 odd air oh. there at the start, and we were managed to get quite a number of them back. Um, but the airlines, of course, realize that, you know, look, um, they can operate the airplanes without paying for them. So they're, they're, um, they're quite happy to keep operating them, unfortunately, and not pay for them. Um, but our exposure, even though it's that big, is relative to the size of the company. It's in balance with the base size of the Russian market uh, on a global basis. But, you know, look, the, um, as I said with Willie, we all hope that there'll be some resolution um, to what's going on, uh, but that will take time, no doubt. And um, from our own perspective, look, it's a global business and we have to operate on a global basis. Russia is somewhat unique in that this, uh, the size of the landmass of the country requires aviation. Uh, and um, Russia was also a heavily domestic market, more so than any other large market, uh, it, because it wasn't exactly on the Lonely Planet Guide of places to visit many cities in, in Moscow or beach resorts. So we didn't have a huge amount of tourism going in there, um, or for that matter, industry. Um, a lot of it was outbound flying or, or, as I said, domestic in Russia. That makes it somewhat unique versus other larger countries. Um, but, you know, we, as I said, um, there's, uh, we just hope that this will come to an end and some resolution can be reached. But uh, for the minute, it, we are where we are. Mm. But, but how do you avoid it happening again? You have other large domestic uh, markets with a l not always so friendly with the West. It yeah. could happen again. So how do, you, how do you reduce that exposure? Or is it just impossible? Well, you can take it. You say, if you say take China as an example, I mean, look, example, if something was to yes. happen there, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, yeah. we'd all be going home, Cathy, you know, at that point. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'd be facing uh, an Armageddon at that stage. Wow. But China is, you know, look, 20, what is it, 24% of everything Airbus builds goes to China. That's yeah. the reality. Yeah. So um, China has been an excellent market for us for many years, for decades. Um, we've had fewer bankruptcies in China, only one actually, um, over the course of the last 30 years. That's not an accusation I can level at any other country. Um, I've been through more bankruptcies than I've had hot dinners in, uh, in Europe and the US. Um, but um, I, uh, I think, look, in that regard, Russia is unique because of its sheer size. Um, other countries um, don't have uh, that, that same geographical size. But as I said, look, we are where we are, Cathy, and we just hope it'll all end soon. Yeah. Okay, you know, but since, you know, Airbus, Boeing, how, how do you see that going, that duopoly? Do you think at a certain moment there will be a third player, at least in the no. narrow body player? No. So, Comac, you know, they just certified for China. I don't think they will certify it for EASA or the FAA. No, no third player? Kelly, what, what will happen over time is a third player will come in. But again, the idea of a competitor to Airbus uh, being viable globally by 2040, I don't see it. Uh, to be a viable competitor to Airbus or Boeing, you have to have a family of aircraft. China has built one aircraft, a Comac. I'm sure that'll be a very good aircraft and it'll work just fine. But when you go to an airline and say, um, uh, I'm going to sell you 100 airplanes, the airline will say, okay, right, well, I need, on the narrow bodies, I need 140 seater, I need 160 seater, 180 seater, or 200 seater. But they want commonality, they want commonality for pilots, for crews, training, parts, etc. And if you're only coming with one of those aircraft um, and you're facing Boeing and Airbus, uh, who have a whole family of aircraft, um, you're not going to be successful. Now, over time, you can build that family. But when we just look at how difficult it is to build an aircraft, it's still one of the most challenging things that we do uh, as, as uh, engineering globally is to build aircraft. So I think we may well see... Um, a, a Chinese manufacturer to rival Airbus and Boeing, but it's a long, long way off. Again, it goes back to the engine analysis. And we haven't talked about a wide body offering as well. Um, so as I said, to be building an aircraft for delivery in the 2030s, it'd need to be in development now. Yeah. And at the moment, the Comac will come. 
um, and no doubt it'll, uh, it'll come into service in, in certain countries around the world over the course of the next eight or nine years. But I think realistically to have a family of aircraft to challenge Boeing and Airbus is a long, long way out. Yeah, just, just look at the challenges Bombardier had. You know, they produce a very good aircraft, uh, which is now the uh, A220. Uh, but you know, they, they, they couldn't succeed. And that's with a, you know, a, a long history of uh, making aircraft. And they produced a very, very good aircraft, but making it a commercial success was going to be impossible for them. You know, so China, you know, the, the C919 will be operated in China. Uh, I actually had uh, an opportunity, I flew the ARJ-21 simulator on a visit to Beijing uh, a number of years ago, which was really interesting. Um, but you know, these are aircraft that will not make a big difference uh, in the time frame that we're talking about. So uh, I think China will succeed, COMAC will definitely produce aircraft. And you have to start somewhere. And, and mm -hmm. primarily it'll serve the Chinese market, uh, and it'll be a good aircraft, but it's not going to be the answer to uh, the uh, what we need is you know strong competition between Boeing and Airbus, and uh, we haven't had that in uh, recent years because of the challenges that both manufacturers have had, but principally the challenges that Boeing have had. Yeah. Would you buy some Comac you know, aircraft? You have Chinese customers. We have some on order. It's a, you have some on order. We sorry. have some okay. on order already. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. You know, to to you know to to talk about the financial aspects of the business and maybe some lessons that we learned from the from the pandemic. We all know that airlines are not the most profitable business or best business to invest in. Return on capital invested is normally low. You know, uh, Willie, what is it? You know, the best uh, pandemic, the best decade we had was before 2019. What is it? 7%, 5%, 7% on five, average? The, the average operating margin between 2010 and 2019, which was the best 10 years, 10 yes. profitable years. And in fact, I think the only 10 consecutive profitable, profitable years at an industry level. And the average operating margin was 5.5%. Yeah. Uh, so now, there were quite a number of airlines that did much better than that. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, you know, in that period, I think we were moving in the right direction to where there was a true return on uh, capital. But uh, they, they still needed a major bailout during the pandemic. And I was surprised yeah, how, but, quickly, but how quickly they needed and how desperately they needed you know, help from, from a government. So has it shown so well the vulnerability for an airline, that cash flow model has shown some kind of a weakness during the pandemic. But, but look at, you know, let's, let's call it what it was. The pandemic, you know, the industry wasn't plunged into crisis by a virus. It was plunged into crisis because governments closed borders, so you couldn't fly. Uh, and that's the reality of it, you know. And, and, the, but it's and the, closure, the closure of borders was a complete waste of time, money and effort. It imposed massive economic harm globally and did nothing to slow down the spread of the virus. You know, at can, best, we can all agree it, on that. It may have done it. We but could all agree on that, but it doesn't show that once again, you know, the financial model, the cash flow model of an airline had some weakness. And I think, you know, but, but there's no industry that can survive being shut down. You know, you, you, you give me an industry that will say, you know, it didn't. But <laughs> he, 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 he didn't shut down. You know, air, airlines were still paying him, or to be fair, it was negotiation well, around. Uh, you know, can we suspend payment for a moment? But, you know, airlines were still paying for the aircraft. That's the problem. Uh, you know, our aircraft so were grounded and we still had to pay for them. We were paying airports for parking our aircraft. Uh, you know, we didn't well, pay air traffic control charges because we, had, we, we were We had almost flying. no revenue and the majority had, of our costs. You know, well, but so what I want, you did help out a lot of, of, course of, we did, of yeah. airlines. Yeah, of course. You know, so my, we have a couple of questions here. My question is, you, you were seen, you helped as much out as, as governments. So is your financial model a little bit more stable and could airlines learn about good housekeeping of a balance sheet? I, look, I think to be fair to the airline industry, over the course of the last 30 year, 20 years, the management of airlines has improved dramatically. Um, we, as Willie said, we did see a period of profitability because the airlines came out of the financial crisis, which was not quite existential for all of them, but it was a very serious event. And we also had $100, $149 oil uh, in 2011, 2012 that they coped with. So that forced a lot more rational behavior from airlines. Uh, but the pandemic, to Willie's point, was, I'll give you a 
I'll, I'll, I'll summarize a phone call I had with Shai Weiss, the CEO of Virgin Atlantic. He called me um, in April 2020, and I was getting these calls every day, and he said to me, look, I have uh, bad news. I said, Chai, what's, what's your bad news? And he said, listen, um, I didn't realize that my revenue line was 100% variable. He'd, stop, he'd shut the fleet down. It was all grounded. So no business, to Willie's point, could survive um, that impact. Uh, now, look, we were in the position where we did have, we, we had 12 billion of liquidity on hand in March 2020. Uh, that helped get us to, but that's a very expensive amount to, to carry. But look, I, I would say as we go forward, I think the airline business, the people running the airline business today are better than they were in the past. The US is an example, and I mentioned this earlier on, of what can happen if we want to try and create, uh, and I hate the word sustainability, but like durable, profitable, tough airlines that can take on the world here in Europe. We're fragmented, we have too many political interests. In the US, they were like that, they got out of it after the financial crisis, they realized, look, if airlines are going into bankruptcy, people are losing their pensions, they're losing their health care, they can't pay their mortgages, um, or else we, the government, have to bail them out. So they let consolidation happen. Some would argue the consolidation may have gone a little bit too far in that market, but certainly here, if we want to build airlines, to your point, um, Cathy, you're absolutely right, are airlines as profitable as they could be? No. But again, one of the impediments is here in Brussels and in European capitals, where they have to allow airlines to achieve scale. You're not really going to stand up on an international scale with 50 airplanes. So you just don't have the, the, uh, the, the, the scale, the buying power. It's very difficult. I mean, look, IAG is on my left hand <coughs> side here. We saw the challenges Aer Lingus faced before IAG took them over. Uh, Aer Lingus would not be here today without IAG. And it was a huge political headache in Ireland to, to sell the national carrier, but it was the right thing to do. And I really feel, and look, dealing with the airlines every day, no one deals with them more than we do. No one. We, uh, we have 2,000 airplanes out in the east of them. That's 10% of the world's fleet almost. Um, we're moving an airplane every day. We're looking at their financials every day. We look at their business models, their maintenance capabilities across the world. And the biggest challenge in this market here in Europe to me, is the uh, nationalism that still surrounds airlines and uh, the local um, political interests around airlines. If we're going to have a strong airline industry here in Europe, and I said, one that can take on uh, the American and, a and Chinese giants, which they will be when they come out of China, um, we have to realize that, or else we're just going to have uh, a gradual decline in our relevance in aviation. And that's probably a reflection of Europe as a whole. You know, but, you know, um, Henrik couldn't be here today. But yes, the change in ownership and control rules, you know, I'm sure it's something that he would support. Not so sure how much other counties would support, but it would definitely help. And Lynn, yes, it would have been very difficult for you to survive without the support of a group of IAG. Or do you think it's possible for some airlines? Some, you have still, I was looking, I was cleaning out you know, my drawers, and what did I see? You know, a beautiful chart from, I think, 20 years ago from a major consultant and said, you know, all, all those secondary airlines, they will be gone in 10 years. They're all still flying. They're all still here. Mm -hmm. So do we see them maybe in the winter? Some say, well, the winter will be difficult. Do we see some go? Well, well, a real consolidation. Yeah, I think mid? what was remarkable in the pandemic was how few airlines uh, exactly. did fail, yeah. actually. Um, and yes, there was state aid, aid injected in some areas. Um, many others accessed capital on commercial terms. Um, now, if the pandemic had lasted any longer, I think we might have seen some different outcomes. Um, but it was remarkable, actually, how few failed. Um, Joseph mentioned earlier, uh, he talked about the old airlines and the new airlines. Well, there are yeah. old airlines uh, that are creating shareholder value and, and, and making money um, and, uh, and are able to thrive. But there are certainly the um, access to capital, ownership and control rules. There are all things on this industry that other industries don't, uh, don't have to face and, and are impediments to uh, a truly healthy industry. Yeah, we, we reckon about 85 airlines failed globally uh, in 2020, 2021. Put an interestingly, uh, you know, similar number started. Now, some of them were reincarnation, you know, you had Alitalia and ETA, you yeah. had Norwegian coming out. So, the, you know, the, 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 but the, the, the industry was remarkably resilient 
Uh, and I think you have to give credit to uh, airline management teams right across the world for you know, taking very tough decisions uh, in order to survive. And you know, these were decisions that nobody really wanted to address but had to because they were forced into a position that we've never been in before. Uh, you know, like people often say, well, how did this compare to previous uh, crises? You know, I look back, 2001, revenues for the industry fell by 6.4%. 2009 fell by 16.5%. 2020 against 2019, revenues were down 56%. Uh, and you've got to remember, the first quarter of 2020 was almost a normal quarter. So, you know, 6.4, 16 uh, 16.5, 56%. That's the scale of it. And then, of course, it continued into 2021. So this crisis has been deeper, more prolonged than anything we had seen before, and yet the industry is still there. And really, I mean, I'd agree with what yourself and Lynn are saying. I'm just saying the potential. Yeah, yeah. It could be so much greater yeah. um, if the airlines were able to run it like yeah. other industries, Agreed. where you don't have this Agreed. continual political yeah. involvement. I, I fully agree with you. It's the reason, you know, when I was at IAG, we created IAG because we felt that consolidation was part of the solution. It's not the solution, but it's definitely part of the solution. But, you know, groups like the, your, the typical the European groups here, you know, they are groups. It's not really consolidated. You know, the airlines remain to be there. So in, in, in the US, of course, you can say it's a big market, but, you know, it's one domestic market. But we could argue that the EU is one big domestic sure. market also. And they consolidated a lot more than here in Europe. You're still, for example, you know, Lynn, okay, you're a smaller airline within the IAG group. So transatlantic for now, you use, you know, you have started using the T20LRs, you know, yes. Could there be further consolidation that all the big, you know, loads could go to, I'm just saying, British Airways or to Iberia? And you, it's uh, not really that so integrated, not like, like in the US. It depends on it. So if you goes. take, um, I think airline brands matter. And they have, they do have, um, uh, many of them do have uh, identities that... Uh, consumers really associate with. So the brands matter. Now, in some cases, if you take consolidation, you know, back in 2012, I think, uh, when I was in Brussels uh, and British Airways bought BMI uh, from Lufthansa, now, uh, for, for that environment, it, the appropriate thing was to, to swallow it, um, to remove the brand, and that's consolidation in the way that you'd see in the US. But in other places, actually having brands that give consumers choice, but still getting economies of scale uh, behind airline groups is a, is a model that can work. Um, and for, you know, for us at Aer Lingus, we're, we're aiming to double our market share across the North Atlantic. We think we've got, we've got a hub that is beautifully positioned. Um, we've got a mix of wide-bodied aircraft for the big routes and, and the new XLR narrow-bodied aircraft so that we can, uh, we can start new routes. If, if I go back to 2013, 2014, Aer Lingus flew four or five destinations to the US. Yeah. We've just announced uh, Cleveland, and we're up to 15. Yeah. So there's plenty of opportunities to, to thrive and to grow um, within the, the European version of consolidation. I know, but is this now the, the nationalism that Angus is talking about? I'm sure that nobody in the US wanted to see Continental go, you know, the brand name. So can you not take a first step by just saying, consumer well, choice. we're letting... If, if the, if the well, brands didn't matter, choice, then, the, then the brands wouldn't need to... It's... Um, Con consumers, like in, in any industry, consumers look at the brands that they, that they have an affinity with um, uh, and develop relationship with. And I, and I do think brands matter in airlines. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, and I think brand is important. But also, if you look at the US, a single AOC is possible in the US. It's still not possible in Europe. That's true. Because oh, there's still... In the, in the AOC. No, but there's still within... That's if you're operating within Europe. But if you're a global operator, there are still parts of the world that will not recognise... Yeah, EU ownership. So you still have to have, yep. you know, rights as the as a carrier based in a European country. So it's not the same. Uh, so there are a number of factors that play against the sort of US type consolidation in Europe. And 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 you're right. Like if you look at uh, United, you know, the United Continental merger, you can see the the pain they went through trying to decide which brand are we going to use. United was the stronger brand internationally. Continental was the better brand domestically. You know, so they decided we'll call it United and use the Continental branding. Uh, but you, you can do that there. Um, you know, culturally, U.S., well, maybe not, but, you know, 
it, it, it's more of a single culture than, than Europe uh, is today. So I, I think there are, um, you know, there is a European way of doing things, and I, I think that that is working for European carriers where they've created these groups. Uh, it's not the same as, uh, it's certainly not as easy as consolidation in the US. Okay, I still have time for one short question. Willie, I'm going to go and ask you. Where do you see IATA in 2030? You know, are you finally going to have some big low-cost carriers as members? Uh, well, we have some low-cost uh, members. And you have, not, but you not, don't have the big ones. No, no. Like uh, Ryanair isn't a member. EasyJet isn't a member. Wiz uh, aren't members. But to be honest, the, the, the bottom line is there's not a lot that we can offer them. Their business model doesn't really fit with the services that we offer. I think they benefit from the uh, advocacy work that we do, uh, and you know they may or may not recognise that. But you know that doesn't mean that IATA isn't relevant. Uh, I think it, it is, and I think it will continue to be. And if they want to join us. Great, but we do have low-cost members who yeah, are, uh, and, and we are speaking to some very large low-cost members about uh, joining as well. Enlighten us, who? Oh no, uh, you'll, have to, <laughs> you'll have to invite me back next year when we start a race. <gasps> okay, well, I thank you all very much. You know, it was very interesting and very lively. Thank you very much for being here. You thank know. you, Peter. Thanks very much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm coming up to down. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. <laughs> and thanks to all the speakers for this extremely interesting debate that we have had on how European aviation will evolve in the next decade. I think the first message that we have received from this panel is that within all the different complexities that we have, there's, there's expectation for significant growth, which is really good for, for, our, for our future. The second point, of course, the main challenge is environment. And we started all to work hard on environment and also to communicate on environment, which was also one of the defects that we had. And here in Eurocontrol, we're working hard to support these two lines uh, as one of our main priorities. Another topic on environment was really around managing expectations on where we will have a, a proportion of SAF uh, air, uh, aircraft using SAF and, of course, uh, the more, let's say, uh, ad advanced technologies for, for electrical planes and hydrogen planes. And this also brought us back to the fact that possibly in the medium term, one of the most important things is that we need to work together hard to improve the trajectory of each airplane. It was said by all the panelists, and that's one of the priorities that we need to do. That's one of the priorities of the Eurocontrol work together with ANSP's airports and airlines to improve that. Then the other part, which I think is, was really, really important, is the fact that there's, there's real doubt that very quickly the regulatory framework will improve, let's say, the situation. And that's where I think everybody said that industry really needs to step up and take role in order to achieve those important things uh, that we need to do as an industry to improve aviation starting from Europe. I think the other major point is on the war in the invasion, uh, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. There was a lot of hope that this would cease. What we're doing in Eurocontrol, of course, we're preparing ourselves. We're working very closely with the Ukrainian colleagues uh, to ensure that there's a strong plan that once the war will cease, immediately after we'll be able to restore operations in Ukraine. Now, the last point is around the that was discussed around the vul vulnerability of the airlines. And I think the, the important message that was given there is that the managerial leadership is here is in the industry, which is a very important factor. Without managerial leadership, we'll not get anywhere. But also that to address vulnerability, it's important to really look a bit more into the consolidation aspects of that. Now with that, I think uh, uh, I would like now to invite the next speaker, which is Simon Hockart. Hi, Simon. Hello. Uh, first of all, of course, Simon is the Director General of Council representing all the NSPs at global level. But of course, probably a uh, few people know that he's also a great technical experience. He was part of uh, the uh, UK Air Navigation Service Provider, NATS, and has also been managing probably one of the most complex uh, ACCs, area control centers in Europe, which was SWANIC. So you will be also be able to answer the question how to better improve the trajectories over Europe. Having said that, I give you the floor, and I'm really eager to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, um, everybody. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. So uh, thank you for that. 
And just to echo, I think, what Eamon said first thing, the, uh, first thing this morning, it is good to be back in a room full of people. Uh, you know, sitting on the end of a TV screen, looking out into nothing, is quite soul-destroying. So um, after all those virtual meetings, it really is a pleasure to see real faces. Now, today's event, well, I think it actually sort of comes at a pivotal time, really, for our industry. Um, we all know, you know, we all know the past few years has ushered in a, an exceptional era uh, for aviation. The global connectivity, the economic and social benefits have been completely decimated, if I'm honest, by the pandemic. And a crisis unlike we've seen before, and I hope we never see again, both in its duration and depth, a crisis that's actually call, called into question the very, very business model or models across our entire, entire aviation industry. And it's a century old, and it calls into question all those business models. And the economics were turned inside and out. As we know, worldwide um, passenger traffic plummeted by 60%. At least a few sectors remain completely unscathed. Everybody's been touched, whether you're an airline, whether you're an airport, and also air traffic management. Now, um, Navigation charge losses for ANSPs during this period in Europe actually exceeded over 7 billion US dollars in 2020 and 13 billion dollars globally. Now this did require a quick response from ANSPs who reacted by reducing their costs within the limits, and there were some limits, of a high fixed cost base, consisting primarily of infrastructure and a skilled workforce. In fact, contrary to popular belief, I think, you know, uh, one of our member surveys uncovered that 97% of ANSPs cut their operating costs in both 2020 and 2021. And obviously, organizations across the entire ecosystem, aviation ecosystem, took similar measures to cut their costs. Now, thankfully, and I think all of us being in this room is testament to this, aviation did prove resilient with very few companies closing their doors during the pandemic. But the recovery so far, and I note this earlier, uh, the point earlier on, is not yet complete, has been and is far from being easy. The huge pent-up demand of travel in some parts of the world has brought about a huge resurgence in air traffic. European traffic has recovered pretty well, as we've seen. In fact, um, just a few weeks ago, many air traffic control centers across Europe were close to 100% of 2019 on certain days. But the recovery has been hampered um, by shortages in different parts of the supply chain uh, and by the ongoing conflict in Ukraine that's been mentioned and actually the impact to the network of these enhanced military activities. In fact, very soon, Airlines are expected to place 100% demand on a European airspace network that only has 80 to 90% capacity. But it's not just Europe. It's not just Europe that's faced difficult times. Other parts of the world have also been really struggling to contend with rapid growth. In the United States uh, alone, IFR flights reach 95% of their pre-pandemic levels and some of the more popular routes actually have gone way beyond the 2019 levels. The system over there has struggled to keep up with demand. Flight cancellation rate um, from late May to the end of August was 2.2% rather than the 6% that we saw earlier on, with airports like Chicago, Washington, Orlando, and JFK seeing over 30% of their flights delayed. Florida this summer suffered massive challenges with the US domestic travel which demand in US for Florida far exceeded the available capacity in any, any walk of the, of, of the aviation uh, system. It became the popular holiday destination for the US because Europe was considered a no-go area still. India. Traffic is booming in India, and one report suggests a 40% increase in ACRA numbers is needed straight away, with 70% more, more required in the coming years. Australia, huge challenge in Australia with the impacts of COVID um, and one of the worst flu seasons on record have led to high levels of short notice, unplanned absences. So that's just an ATM. And if we look 
beyond ATM, other parts of the aviation ecosystem appear to have been caught off guard. By broadly, how quickly traffic has rebounded. So we've got images of all over the world, um, where passengers queuing outside terminals to clear security. I live in the Netherlands, so I'm very akin to the, the skip-off problem. Suitcases stacked in baggage halls, departure screens for the flight cancellations, they're all becoming the norm. The fragility of an already creaking at the systems, cre creaking at the seams, sorry, system has been laid bare for all of us to see entirely across the globe and not just in Europe. Aviation, for me, has reached a tipping point. Improving efficiency, we've heard this morning, and creating a more scalable, up and down scalable, and resilient system has never been more urgent. So what's the key? Well, I think the key, actually, is collaboration. How can we work together across the entire aviation system to ensure that the scenes we've witnessed over the past few months are condemned to the history books? Don't want to see them again. How can we help restore public confidence in air travel? So I want to first start by looking at ATM. What can we do to improve? Well, the first thing we need to tackle is taking care of our most valuable asset, our people. Currently, whether we like it or not, we are still a heavily people-based industry. One of the key lessons that we've learned um, from past crisis, um, from the, well, actually from the, the pandemic, is to resist knee-jerk reactions to short-term challenges that would have long-term consequences. That was applied through the, re uh, the recent crisis, with a few ANSPs uh, cutting valuable operational staff, which often takes years to train, preferring instead to require new debt to cover revenue shortfalls. In Germany, for example, we know the DFS continued ACO training during COVID. Italy's ENAV have ensured full ACO licensing throughout the pandemic in Spain, and are reinforced training and simulation tools to ensure there are new ACOs ready for this summer season. <coughs> now, looking to the future, we need to continue to invest in our operational staff despite the financial challenges we all face. Right now, we have just over 17,400 operational ACOs in Europe, and we need a lot more to deal with the future increases in traffic that we're all hoping for. As Joseph mentioned this morning, this takes time and significant investment to make happen. Now, technology. Uh, Aim and slide first thing, you'll, you'll spot some familiar words from Aim and slide first thing. Technology can help us bridge the gap. We need to continue to invest in the tools and systems that will enable controllers to handle the increased traffic levels. Um, beyond staffing and technology, there are other tools at our disposal that can help provide much needed capacity. There's free route airspace, which allows pilots to plan a route between defined entry point and a defined exit point rather than follow the route set by an air traffic controller. Now, estimates show that FRA or free route airspace could save as much as 1 billion nautical miles, 6 million tons of fuel, 20, millions ton, 20 million tons of CO2, and 5 billion euros in fuel savings. Now, whilst Europe is along this journey of FRA, there is still much to do. But this type of work is essential. We heard about the costs this morning, about making, making aviation more sustainable and really going after those costs and efficiencies now is essential, and this is one of the things that we can do to do that. Flow management, now I would say this, um, as chairman of the Network Management Board, is also a game changer. But it is a game changer. It enabled us to macro massage, massage or macro manage, actually, two different words. Um, enabled us to regulate, is it regulate air traffic to ensure the efficient use of the available capacity. No one player, no individual cog in the wheel actually can handle the capacity issues alone. We need to look at the bigger picture to smooth those traffic flows. And within Europe, the network manager will continue to play that vital role. Optimizing the ATM network and its interfaces by using collaborative decision making. It saves airlines from wasting unnecessary time and fuel burn, and that's got to be the aim for the industry. By working together to flag potential delays early, everyone gets the all important arrival and departure information at the same time. This allows the different organizations involved in, in the entire flight to adjust their schedules and resourcing as the latest information becomes available. Technology enables this 
but do we do it effectively? Recent events in Europe have actually also shone a light on the need for strength and collaboration between ANSPs, the Air Navigation Service Providers, and the military in order to address the new security reality that we all know we face. Now, outstanding civil military collaboration already has identified flexible solutions, which has ensured, to date, a pretty efficient balance between security and commercial interests. It's enabled us to minimize the impact on civil air traffic flows. Now, we're focused, really focused on strengthening those collaborations. We've engaged in discussions with organizations like NATO to discuss how we best manage this finite resource. And it is finite, it's not infinite, that, that resource that we call airspace. We need to ensure our standards are harmonized, that we enhance interoperability, and that we enable the real-time exchange of data and information securely and safely between military and civil service providers. Digitalization, automation, artificial intelligence, there you go, I've said it. Um, thank you, Eamon. Um, will also be a driving force for modernizing our current ATM activities and providing that additional extra capacity that's needed. They will enable a higher level of automation and the virtualization of services that is needed, actually, to facilitate a greener, safer, more efficient, resilient, and more scalable ATM system. I don't apologize for using the word scalable a number of times. As well as smoothing the way for the safe integration of new airborne vehicles. Now, we mustn't forget these. Digitizing our skies won't be easy. Um, I'm encouraged to see the progress that ANSP is already making, and they are making progress. They are finding innovative ways to overcome the huge challenges that we are facing. But we do need to move with some urgency, far more urgency than perhaps we have done to date. Our skies do look to become even more overcrowded, not just with the traditional airlines that we perhaps we've been talking much more about this morning, but we've got drones, we've got commercial space vehicles, we've got EVATOLs. How can we improve efficiency to handle not only today's traditional airlines, but also all these other users that are wanting getting in our skies into this finite resource we have airspace? Now, solving one of these puzzles is a nightmare, but it's one of the triggers that caused us to create the Complete Air Traffic System Global Council. It's an innovation forum with 70 leaders across the entire aviation ecosystem. And we're set about looking about how we could achieve a fully scalable, sustainable, and resilient airspace system. It's been going for about 18 months. We brought a shared vision. Um, it's to create a global airspace that is fair, it's sustainable, it's safe, intelligent, interoperable, leveraging revolutionized design, technology, and services to power global mobility and prosperity. And that's a really great phrase, but I, as we all know in this industry, unless you make it happen and implement it, it doesn't mean a lot. So we're already in action on that, and we developed a roadmap that will enable us to achieve our vision across the whole of aviation. Now, you'll not be surprised, that a, red, a red thread, if you like, running through that vision is collaboration. We all need to work together to make that happen. We need to collaborate on key areas such as the research and development required to make our vision a reality. So that's more of a longer term. What about the short term? What about next summer? What about this winter, next summer? How do we help improve efficiency that the next summer isn't a repeat of this last one? We've survived, was the phrase they used this morning, and I think that's a good phrase. We survived this summer. We can't just survive next summer. First, we need consistency and predictability from airlines and airports. Today's airlines introduce new routes without always recognizing that the system can't respond that fast. Cancellation of 6% of flights uh, on a daily basis actually causes issues and challenges that we all have to deal with. Some of them caused by ATM, just to get that on the record. Not all of them, but some of them. They worry about the maintenance of the gates at the airport sometimes and ground, but do airlines always consider the effects of airspace all down route? We all need to get better at that. I'm not giving the problem to the airlines. I'm not giving the problem to the airports. We're all together in it, and we all need to help to be able to solve that. We also need to improve the impact of local issues on the overall network. So we mentioned the word strike, and we already referred to it. So last Thursday, I think it was a total of 20 controllers. It's 12 in one place and eight in another, went on strike in France. Now, it impacted at least 21,000 flights, I think, 
that one, the, the, the small group of people, and it caused over 350,000 minutes of delay. Now, whilst I support the right for people to protest on their terms and condition, conditions, I don't support the fact that it impacts internationally and or globally. We have to work hard to solve the problem of a local issue impacting international, if not global. This cannot be acceptable for us as an industry moving forward. A final area we can work on is civil military coordination. It is highly likely that the Ukrainian airspace will continue to remain closed for the foreseeable future. And as I mentioned before, this reduces European airspace capacity by 10 to 20 percent. Now, Germany is also understandably given over a chunk of its airspace to UN troop operations, and while DFS is doing a fabulous job actually dealing with that, we need to continue to work with NATO to minimize the impact of these airspace closures. So there's plenty we can do to get in good shape for the future. We need to invest in our most valuable asset, our people. We need to invest in the tools and systems that will support them, and there will be a cost to that. We need to keep an eye on the short term as well as the long term, and we need to make our future airspace more scalable. One of the phenomena um, of this current crisis is that those organizations that proved to be scalable on the downside of the traffic downturn didn't turn out to be as scalable on the upside too. We must not lose sight of that. We need to develop a future airspace system that is fully scalable and can flex up and down according to our customers' demands and needs at short-term notice as well as medium-term and long-term. And most important of all, we need to continue to work together with a variety of different stakeholders across the, well, the ATM industry and also beyond. We need to innovate, we need to share information. At the end of the day, we are all in this together. We all want aviation to be successful. And in the words of an African proverb I heard just last week, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I hope that's given you a few things to think about. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Simon. Thank you for sharing the uh, navigation service provider's perspective. I think you touched on a very important point, which is you need really to take all the lessons learned possible from any crisis. And of course, the rebound effect and the differences which we have been seeing in this rebound are clear to everyone, and we need to, to take action on that. The air traffic management infrastructure, like the airport infrastructure, is rigid by nature. And to allow scalability and flexibility, there are some medium-term actions that we need to do. And you, you, you talked about some of them, like the operational improvements with free route airspace, like the digitalization of our network that we need to do. And we, in Eurocontrol, are working hard with our projects also to support uh, the stakeholders to achieve that goal. Uh, but moreover, we need also to do uh, important short-term actions. And, and working in partnership is an essential asset. You have said it, uh, we have one single bottleneck during whatever summer we fail as a whole in the network. And, and to this end, I think uh, the actions that you were mentioning for next summer, the planning process, the common planning process to make sure that we achieve the best possible performance for next summer is a key asset. We're working, as you know, in Eurocontrol and Eurocontrol Network Manager very hard with the airlines, airport, and S NSPs with that endeavor. And of course, we call really on the industry to really support this kind of approach. Next point on strike was said by everyone. I think, uh, thank you for raising it again, Simon. I think this is a fundamental element. The issue, especially the overflights, needs to be tackled rather soon. And the last point that I think uh, you have mentioned is around the timing as well as partnering. Of course, we need to accelerate the improvement. So probably with uh, the motto that you were mentioning, of course, it's good to do the road together, but also timely deployment is absolutely an essential element, and we are need to work hard to accelerate all the operational improvements that we have in the pipeline. Now, having said that, I think we are landing with three minutes early, so it's good for, for the network. Uh, and now we are moving over to the break for lunch. It's in the lobby, so just exit from here and you go in the lobby. And of course, we'll be starting on time, 13.30 sharp, so you have an hour and a half of break for lunch. Enjoy. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Where to Next for European Aviation, organized by Eurocontrol. Uh, first of all, I hope you really had an enjoyable time during lunch to make a lot of exchanges among all of us. Uh, I want to provide you some figures, first of all, because I think we are very proud. We had more than 350 people today, the biggest conference ever organized in Eurocontrol. Uh, but also, we have 3,000 people connected, which uh, means uh, that uh, the discussions we're having today will have a lot of echoes. I'm really looking forward to continuing and implementing some of the discussions we have going forward. But now, uh, this afternoon, we're going to have another two keynote speakers and another very interesting panel. And the first keynote speaker will be Torsten Lange. <laughs> First of all, welcome, and I think you have a really an important challenge. You need to shake the audience this afternoon. Yeah. So first of all, we heard this morning that Angus Kelly was very clear on when the SAF will be available, if and whatever impact will have. So the floor is yours to meet this challenge this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, and, and, and again, thank you for giving me the assignment to waking up the people, but uh, I make sure that it will take place. Um, the dead shift, as we call it, but... Uh, um, let me start with, a, you know, with also with a provoking question here. Sorry, too fast. Um, you know, this is, this is um, a group of experts, a group of aviation enthusiasts. A lot of you have been flying in, I assume. How many have been flying in? You know, it's a bit of active uh, listening now. Good. So, let's say roughly half. How many of you have been compensating for their flights? <laughs> Look at your neighbor deep into the eyes. <laughs> and this is the experts. This is the people that are talking about sustainable aviation and about the future of aviation. And correct me if I'm wrong, it was not even 10. So why is it? Why are people not compensating? And I think a lot comes through. People don't know how to do that. That's the one group. The other group is saying it's too expensive. And hopefully you're not in the third one saying, I don't care, I want to fly, it's not my problem. It is actually our problem. And some of you may have thought that time for waste is uh, wrongly spelled here, it's not time to waste, but actually it's a bit of a double meaning here, time for waste, and I come to that later, because we have a solution, we have a part of the solution. And that's important, and that's what we heard earlier this morning already, it's not just one thing. It's not a silver bullet that we are looking for here. Um, it's many solutions. It's come, it comes from the technical side, it comes from the ATM side, but certainly also then it comes from the fuel side. All of that has to be taken into account. But the most important thing is we have to start today. There is no time to waste, but we have time for waste now. You all know, and if you don't know, I tell you there's a high probability that already in the next five years, we will at least in one year, exceeding the critical 1.5 degrees for sure. That tells you that we rather start yesterday than tomorrow. How can we do that? Together. We all have to work together. It's the airport, it's the regulators, it's the airlines, it's the producers, it's ATM. But at the end also, it's the passenger. We jointly have to educate the passenger and train the passenger, make them aware of what can be done and when it can be done. The answer is actually now. Angus was raising some concerns this morning about availability, and I know all of you have doubts on whether or not sustainable aviation fuel can be made available. And again, it's the great chicken and egg question. So what is, is there the demand or is there the production? But coming from the aviation industry, or coming from industry in general, would you invest if there's no demand certainty? Would you build a refinery in the order of magnitude of, let's say, one and a half to two billion, if you don't know where to place the product in future? Or would you wait until somebody is coming um, and, and supporting this? Ballpark numbers. You know the two to three percent that aviation has impact on the greenhouse gas emissions, or let's say on the overall climate impact. This is particularly true for the current situation, and we heard this morning that probably technologies will not succeed in the aviation business, but 
EV and hydrogen will succeed in other sectors, which means the problem of what we think currently is just 2 to 3% could well be around 20% in 2030 or 2035. So the responsibility, if you so will, is shifting. And this is just thinking about the greenhouse gas emissions and not so about the non-CO2 effects, which also are playing an important role. Actually, two-thirds of the overall climate impact is coming from the non-CO2 effects. I don't want to educate you today on non-CO2 effects, but there's various papers. Uh, there is even from DLR, there is a study explaining what that is. So I would highly recommend you to read it in order to understand what benefits you could have from using sustainable aviation fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel is a solution, but again, it's just one of the solutions um, we should be striving for. Um, and although, and this is a bit you know, positive for our business, um, and, and, and also a bit of a surprise to me, because I started in 2020, you know, moving from, from Lufthansa to, to Neste, um, and then in March 2030, I thought, okay, and in March 2020, I thought, okay, this is all over. I mean, I'm, what shall I do? Aviation is no longer existent. Um, my sustainable aviation fuel future is gone before it even started. Uh, what actually happened is sustainability is now in everybody's mind. It has accelerated. And so did we in Nesta, by the way. Um, we're coming, and here it's a bit about numbers, not too much number crunching, but you can just make a calculation later. We started in 2019 with roughly 100,000 tons. And the same was true for 2020, for 21, and for 22. Because it takes a lot of time to building up capacities. And not only time, but also money. Now we're starting to produce, or we will be starting to produce in 2023, our Singapore refinery will be up and running in April next year, able to produce on an annual basis one million tons of sustainable aviation fuel. On top of that, we will have another 500,000 tons available end of next year, actually in Q4, out of our Rotterdam refinery. And we will already then start to building a new refinery that will come on stream in 2026, this is the current plan, to being able to produce another 700,000 tons. This is just one number. The other number, talking about is it enough or not, in 2025, most likely, the European Union will be introducing a mandate of 2%. 2% of a market which is currently roughly, excluding the UK now, unfortunately, um, of 50 million tons. So you do the math, 2% is a million tons. So we alone could already supply the European market and still there's product left for the rest of the world. For example, for markets like the US, which do have certainly a different approach than what we have in Europe. But um, both of those models uh, do have their justification. What are our plans and where are we going and where are we already? Um, bringing, brings me back to the question I had earlier, because people think, you know, where can I buy that? How can I buy that? Um, this is the work we have been doing in the last two and a half years. So you see, we are making stuff available already globally. And we don't do that alone, and this is the important information here, and this is something that I would like also our competitors to do. Share the activities. I mean, we are supplying our future competitors with fuel in order to making sustainable aviation fuel available. This is really a joint effort. If everybody would just cook in his own kitchen, we will never succeed. That's the important point. So we go to airlines, we go to suppliers, um, um, we go to distributors uh, to making stuff available, and I think this is very much a success story. This success story needs certainly some support. And I was talking about uh, the little nudge, the regulatory environment that you need in order to, to generate demand. 
nobody would invest without demand certainty. And here you have the two global models, if you so will. On the right hand side, you have Europe. Europe decided to go for a principle that is called mandates. Mandates are what I call an uh, insect solution. So you make the aviation pay um, for what they're generating by making it mandatory to using a certain percentage of fuel. Starting small with 2%, um, growing up to 5 or 6% in 2030, and then at the long end uh, in 2060, uh, 2050, we are at 63% mandate. That's currently the plan. This is a bit different from what you have in the US. Um, the US has an incentive scheme. Um, how does that incentive scheme work? Or let's say, what does it consist of? Actually, there's three different components in. One is the, by the tax player subsidized so-called BTC. It's a blender's tax credit. This is the amount you're getting when you're blending the product, meaning the soft component and the fossil component in the US. You get a certain, um, a certain amount. The other one is the rinse you are generating. So it's the, um, in that renewable system that you have in the US, um, you, get a, you get a reward for every gallon that you're producing and that you can cash in. And then on the west coast of the US, you also have the low carbon fuel standards, which is another component to generating credits. Where's that money coming from? It's from the overall renewable fuels business in the US. One could also say there is a sector that has a mandate because you have to fulfill a certain requirement and then the aviation industry has the opportunity to making use of that using the credits to getting relatively cheap sustainable aviation fuel. I'm not judging is this right or wrong. I'm just trying to explain what it is. And I leave it with you, with you to, to now telling me, maybe not today, but later, what's the right, what's the wrong way. Maybe we need both. But if you really want to have additional environmental changes and impact, you would need to do something above those um, levels that we, for example, have in the US. Food for thought. Forget about what you have on the right side here in dark blue. This was the plans that um, several EU member states had before they aligned in review EU on what the mandates are. There was clear wishes from some, especially the Nordic countries, to having higher mandates. That has now been kind of shrunken, uh, and they all align now on a certain level here. Where does all that stuff come from? I think this is the biggest question, and this is where we need your help. Not today but mid to long term. The product we're currently producing is our so-called heifer technology. That heifer technology is using waste. Remember, time for waste. Um, it is currently only used cooking oil and animal fat. Sounds a bit disgusting sometimes, but it is, it is what it is. Um, and what else would you do with that? Um, Sourcing around the globe until 2030 would allow us to release around 40 million tons of those, of those components. So that's, that's a lot, but that's not enough. It is enough currently, it will be enough in 26, in 27, but then somewhere there comes a point where we need additional feedstocks and we need additional technologies. Let's start with the feedstocks first. We do have Red 2 slash 3, we do have the refuel EU aviation um, that is currently in the trialogues in Brussels and being discussed. Um, there is a trend to have a more narrow view on what, what feedstocks can be made eligible uh, to being used for sustainable aviation fuel to then later being allowed um, to report emissions, emission reductions. We are of the opinion, and we are not alone, there's a lot of people um, are of the opinion that we do have high potential of roughly 160 million tons of raw materials that are not yet included in the discussions, 
but could well be included also when you're talking to RSB, to ISCC, to the, to the auditing bodies um, around the world saying, this is fully qualified product, it's just not accepted. It needs to be accepted. And this is what, we, what I would like to ask you for when you go home, when you talk to your politicians, um, um, and, and raise the topic here and, and discuss with them what is it that we can do to making those products available. Little example, I was just last week, I was in Italy um, um, and talking to the biotech industry and there was also some farming industry around and they were talking about contaminated land, um, um, abandoned land, idle land that, that, that is not being used with soil that is basically um, so toxic that you cannot plant anything. But what you can still do, you can plant oil trees on that. You can plant cover crops on that. That would do both. They would produce oil and they would help to recover the soil. Um, I personally cannot see why those things should not be made eligible to producing fuels. But this is something that we need to discuss. Next big topic, lignocellulosics. What does it mean? It's basically, it's all from wood, from wood waste. Don't forget, we're talking about waste here. Also, those products are currently under revision. Are they really qualified? Are they really sustainable? Um, I would say yes. Others are saying no. The fact of the matter is, we could globally source 660 million tons of woody biomass to producing fuel from that, either to, to the alcohol to jetway or to gasification, and then something that's called the fischer tropsch uh, process, where you would make fuel from that. On top of that, we are also working on municipal solid waste. And there, the feedstock pool is almost unlimited. We're talking about 1.1 billion tons of waste that can be used. All of this costs money. Um, you can imagine if you, if you just collect the waste and put it into a refinery, it's not an easy feedstock, so it needs a lot of treatment, a lot of attention, and some very robust technology. But it can be done. And then, at the end of the day, and we heard it briefly this morning, comes hydrogen. Not hydrogen in the form of hydrogen, but hydrogen as, as a fuel. Because you can do the next step after you had hydrogen and you add CO2, just a, a rough explanation, you can make fuel from that. Sewer so process. Once you have enough additional green energy, and currently we have everything but uh, energy in excess, just to remind you, for those who are saying, this is the silver bullet, this is the solution, it's not now. And then also you have to find out where to get all that CO2 from. I mean, we, actually we do have a problem because there's too much CO2, but it's in the air. So how do we capture that? How do we collect it and then making fuel from that? Also in an environment where we're aiming to reducing CO2. So another challenge that we have to sort out. So power to liquid is a solution, is one of the solutions. But if you ask me, not before 2035. What can those products do? Um, they are so-called um, drop-in solutions. So they are physically identical with jet. The beauty of this, compared to hydrogen, and we also heard this morning, hydrogen is maybe not even a chance, but for me, one of the most critical criteria here is for hydrogen, you would need a completely new infrastructure. That is not the case for SAF. No matter what SAF we're talking, it is fuel. It's blended with the conventional fuel at the airport, which is, by the way, also coming back to the beginning. The funny thing, people said, where can I buy it? Is it really in my aircraft when I'm paying for that? And I have bad news for people that are paying for SAF. They may be not flying on SAF. Why is it? You're blending the stuff, let's say in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a blend ratio from 40 to 60, 40 stuff, 60 fossil, and you bring a barge, let's say, to Frankfurt. Then you pour it into a system, 2,000 tons boop, into, into a tank. In an airport that is consuming roughly 20 to 25,000 tons a day. So now you think as an airline you bought the, the, the stuff for, for flights on Wednesday and it's coming in on Monday. It's burned already. 
So it's a calculation thing. It's a mass balance thing, we call it. Um, um, and to do the calculation and making sure that only those who have been buying the fuel are also allowed to report. So you can imagine there's a lot of checks and balances behind to making sure that we don't have double counting and cheating. Because the worst thing that could happen is, is that, but that we've been seen as greenwashed, things are being double, triple, whatever, four times counted. That must not happen. So a lot of things have to be done in the background, but it's sorted already and we can do that. Using SAF is reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, by 80%. And I think this is a, a very, good, very good message. It's not 100, because when you're talking to people, they said, well, this is, again, this is not 100. Um, I think, you know, let's better make a little step rather than nothing. So I'm getting already kind of, do, do I get penalized? No, it's, uh, thank you. Um, happy to getting your questions. Torsten.lange at neste.com. Bombard me with your emails. Whatever questions you have, I'm ready to answer then. Um, unfortunately, not today because I have to leave, but look, uh, great, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Torsten. Thanks for joining. <laughs> very insightful. We're a, bit, we're a bit delayed, but very slightly, but uh, the, the, the presentation was very insightful. Uh, the, all the messages are fully shared, the joint mission. Uh, the fact that technologies in aviation are going to be more difficult to implement so we can have a competitive disadvantage, of course, and being having a pragmatic approach in building the SAF implementation, we all saw it. Without further delay, I would like now, uh, since we have a very important panel, Kathy, now I got it right, I hope, Kathy. Kathy. Uh, Thank you. Kathy will be talking about yes. avoiding the case. So hello again, good afternoon. So I hope you're all looking forward to the second debate of the day where we'll discuss what went wrong this summer. And yes, it did go wrong. And more importantly, how to go forward without the same level of turbulence. So I would like to call our four <coughs> panelists onto the stage. Arnaud, please, Thomas, Florian, and Livia. Official, hello. <laughs> so, again, thank you very much for being here. Please allow me, we all know each other, but I don't think everybody in the audience knows you. So here on my left, Livia, you know, Secretary General of the ETF, the Transport, European Transport Federation. You represent about five billion yeah. transport workers. workers. Yes, okay. Fantastic, Arno Feist, you know, the um, chief executive of Brussels Airport, everybody who flies in and out. Well, there is a man, if not it enough, goes wrong. Not enough, not enough. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Thomas <laughs> Reinhardt, um, I want to call you director general, but it's not important. MD, yes, MD from Airlines for Europe, Brussels' most important uh, trade association for airlines, and he has a nice mix of members. Legacy Airlines and low-cost airlines. <coughs> Thomas, yes. Correct. Okay. And then, of course, Florian Guillermet. He heads, he's a director of the French ANSP, you know, Air Service Navigation Provider, DSNA. So, um, the summer season was busy. That's the good news. There's also bad news. We saw it on the video this morning. It did not go very well. It was turbulent. Now, I have been covering aviation for a long time. And there have been moments this summer that I thought the world was upside down. I'm sorry. You know, so airlines that have been fighting for years how to add seats on their aircraft suddenly took a row of six seats out on a narrow body. Um, airlines had to cancel at last minute flights, passengers in the queues. A couple of airport bosses lost their job. I know, not yours. Your airport did very well. So um, it was, you know, uh, it was definitely not um, within the expectations of an, of, of an industry where that I thought was very streamlined and organized. So a couple of things went wrong. So I would like to ask you each two questions. What do you think is the main reason that it did go wrong? What happened exactly? And how do you suggest we go forward so we don't have the same level of turbulence. Livia. 
So first of all, I think there is one thing you didn't mention that happened this summer is that workers were extremely under pressure and uh, they uh, were extremely committed to make aviation work even this in these tough conditions. And they were and they are still exposed to uh, unprecedented level levels of violence. Uh, and this is something on which we are working with our social partners in Brussels, but this is something very important because it's uh, an explosive uh, uh, situation at the moment. So what went wrong? We said it this morning, uh, aviation is an ecosystem. If one of the parts of the ecosystem is playing without talking to the others, without, without taking to, into consideration what, what's happening on the other parts, then the system explodes. And this is something that happened. The problems were there. It was also said this morning, and uh, COVID was the perfect storm. Uh, I think Imon said it very clearly during his presentation. The problem uh, was triggered in ground handling. People do not want to work in ground handling anymore. It's not, it's not a, it doesn't come by a surprise. And why should people go and work on social shifts uh, to be paid much less than what they are paid in a town? They need to have a car. Uh, they have precarious contracts. The job is very hard. So if we want to have people employed in a, in a tough put in a tough job in a tough profession that we need to pay them so clearly uh, what can we do to reverse the situation we need to uh, change the sector we need to uh, make sure that all the parts talk to each other and that there's no uh, pressure just uh, from one uh, of the component to the others without dialogue okay great i know what do you think went wrong well, as you kindly said, I think at Brussels Airport, uh, I uh, think it went, it went well. We didn't have major chaos or, or queues. Uh, you know, it was under control, of course. At some point, there were, there were some, some, some queuing, but, but very limited. Uh, I think we have to, remem to remember when we're coming, coming from. You know, early, early January, we were at 15% of our normal activity. We went up to 80 85% during the summer. So there's a, a you know, rapid ramp up for, for our industry. <laughs> now, I think... In many, uh, at many Europe, uh, European airports, things went well, uh, but not everywhere. It's been a challenging summer, indeed, for, for our industry, also for the, the image of our industry. Uh, and I think that it's a, it, it comes from two factors combined, which is one, on, uh, is sort of faster you know, traffic increase compared to what was expected at some airports, and at the same time, you know, a shortage, and, and an acute shortage even on, on, on the labor market. The labor market has been very tight, and a combination of these two has made it, made it very difficult. Now, I think, in, in fairness, the situation has improved during the summer. I think, you know, a lot of airports have recruited more people, deploying more and more, uh, more staff, and that's, that's helped, uh, you know, the situation to improve. The four largest airports, indeed, have reduced capacity, and, and we all know uh, it was in the, in the front page of, of many newspapers. But I think, uh, of course, it's not, it's not uh, you know, the, the optimal situation for, for airlines and, and for passengers, definitely not. But I think it would have probably been worse if they hadn't, hadn't done anything. No, I, I'm, I'm not being complacent, saying, okay, you know, you know it's, a, it's a rosy picture. No, I think we, we all have to, to realize that, that the problem is actually a kind of a systemic problem. Uh, it's not only just the, 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 uh, the airport or the, or the aviation in itself. It goes way beyond that. I think it extends to, you know, tourism and then hospitality in general. A lot of restaurants, hotels don't find stuff. So I think the, the real challenge that I see, it, and probably, uh, you know, we'll discuss that later on, is how do we attract people back to, to our sector? I think that's the, the, the biggest challenge. You know, how do we make sure that we end up with enough people to serve our, our customers? Yeah. Thomas, you want to point a finger to somebody, feel free. You know. Yes, <laughs> so, so uh, thanks, Arno. I think you, you mentioned a couple of uh, very important points there. Um, I think, well, first of all, I had also have to think of uh, Josef Aradi's uh, intervention this morning where he mentioned, uh, pointed to the inefficient ecosystem. I think that's how he called it. So I think what we've seen, some of what we've seen this summer is actually proof of this inefficient ecosystem, as you know, and the way Josef explained it, we airlines are takers of services, of technologies. So we're on the demand side, and, and if something doesn't really uh, uh, go smoothly, then obviously we have a problem. We have to explain this to, to the passenger at the end of the day with all kinds of consequences. But let me not deny the fact that the consequences we've seen this summer, um, as you said, I know, is, is really the result of a steep ramp, uh, ramp, ramp up in operations. I don't think we can deny that also on the airline side. Um, uh, so we shouldn't forget that we actually come from, from very far and all of a sudden, um, the amount went up. Well, when I say all of a sudden, I think we also have to be honest and congratulate also Eurocontrol uh, on their forecasts because 
uh, the forecasts were quite clear um, uh, from from the, from the from the, from the north. Um, and um, uh, I, I think what 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 happened. That's my second point. Is that um, from the airline side, we whatever happens, we will need to provide a reliable and a very punctual service. This is what uh, the passenger, what the customer is is expecting. Um, we've uh, as airlines, we've been shown be quite resilient this summer. Um, some of our A4E members have gone beyond 90% of capacity versus 2019, and some of them actually did very well. Uh, but many did not do so well. I could have done a lot better if the circumstances were, were better. So um, airlines, in, in, unfortunately, are dependent on some of these external factors and external or third, uh, third suppliers. And it's, I think it's quite evident that we've seen uh, in some airports, I would say mainly some European uh, hub airports uh, in Europe, we've, we've seen a, a capacity uh, problem, capacity reduction, mandatory capacity reduction as well, um, which of course doesn't work for the airlines. And then we have to explain to the customer actually what, what happens. Um, and I think uh, the third point to, to, to maybe finish that, I think what we sort of lessons learned from what we call the little summer crisis, but there will be other crises. It's mm -hmm. not the first and the last time that uh, these challenges of uh, capacity issue at airports and ATC, by the way, will, will happen. I think we need to absolutely work better together in order to avoid, um, especially in-season uh, capacity reduction, and especially when it's really at shorthand. It really uh, is very bad for us if we learn 24 hours in advance or even less from an airport, but also from an ATC organization, oh, by the way, you know, there's a strike tomorrow, oh, by the way, you have to reduce capacity. It is certainly not the interest of any of us for the airlines having to cancel, uh, to cancel flights. Yeah. So um, if we could look at the better predictability uh, in season, also other season, but certainly in season, uh, when capacity is being reduced, that would be, I think, or would have been a great help. We've seen some examples. Um, Sorry. Uh, yeah, we'll just very come quickly. back to that. Yes, okay, we'll you know, we have that. lots of topics. Florian, did it go wrong for you? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, maybe just to highlight and to pick up on two things that have already been mentioned. The, the ecosystem <laughs> thing, I think it's essential because we are all trying to do the best we can at uh, individual organization level. But uh, uh, the chaos comes when uh, the information is not shared or when we don't work together as part of an ecosystem. And I think to do that, we need to share information. That's essential. Uh, we see what happens when we do not share properly the information. And this is typically what happened the last week with the French system. It created chaos. Um, but we need as well coordination. And, and uh, this coordination, uh, when it comes to air traffic management, um, is essential because we are managing flows of traffic that are crossing uh, the European airspace. Uh, and I think what is essential is to build upon what has been done this summer, uh, where things were not perfect, but still we were able to ramp up the system together thanks to the coordination that was performed in particular by Eurocontrol, by the network manager. Uh, just to prove that this can work, uh, we managed to implement in the RAN CCC, which is in the core area of Europe, a brand new ATC system uh, in April up to uh, June. And we managed to do that thanks to the coordination we had in the ecosystem. Uh, we managed to provide predictability. We worked with our neighbors. We worked with an NM, of course. But we worked as well with the airlines. And everybody in the chain played the game. And we managed to go through this period of time. I'm not saying it was a, an easy pass, but uh, it, was, it went reasonably well. I think the second element that I want to mention beyond the ecosystem is uh, our uh, joint ability to scale up and scale down. Uh, we, we really have a true difficulty um, because of uh, uh, the infrastructure system that is behind uh, the scene to ramp up uh, fast uh, our activities and as well to scale them down. Maybe that's a lesson learned as well for next year, and uh, I think this is typically what we are trying to achieve uh, with Jacopo, with the network manager, to, to plan a bit ahead, maybe, of what will happen, because it's easy, easier to scale down a little bit than to scale up at the very last moment. Yeah, but, you know, what comes up, and this morning was mentioned too, you know, so there were staffing issues, you know, a quick ramp up, uh, lack of coordination. No. Thomas, you mentioned it, Eurocontrol had its, you know, uh, forecast and they were about one percentage point off. I think we all can live with that, you know, one up, one down. Now, coordination. 
please explain it to me as, as you know, obviously I'm ignorant here. You know, I'm looking at you, Thomas, and, and Arnaud. What an airline schedules what? About six months in advance before they have to have the aircraft, the pilots, and so on. And then Arnaud, they come knocking at your door and say, I'm going to operate so many flights at your airport. I would like to have so many check-in counters, so many baggage handlers, and so on. So you knew about what was... Where did it go wrong? And I think what the airlines didn't come to you to say, I need so many people. Um, you all work, you know, maybe like, you know, Florian says, are you working in operational silos? No, I mean, I, I, you know, again, talking from, from, my, from my own airport, I think clearly uh, it went very well. We, we have been a lot of dialogues with airlines in first instance, with our home carrier, but also with, with other uh, airlines flying to the airport. So we know in, indeed way in advance. And that's why, uh, you know, in, in, you know, at Brussels, we started already in November last year to plan for the summer. Uh, but again, it was a bit of a, a gamble to say, okay, what will traffic be in, uh, in uh, July, August? And of course, we read with great attention, you know, the aero control forecast, and we thought, okay, if that's true, then we need to be staffed. And we started recruiting already in November last year, just in anticipation, and we tested in, in, uh, in Easter, and I think it went well. But, but the real issue that we see, because we also faced, you know, tough situation, especially in the second quarter, to get the staff on board, is to, how do you make this sector attractive to employees? You know, during the COVID crisis, people stay at home for, what, 18 months, sometimes even more. In many instances, they get partly paid, no, not fully. But then, and then you come back and say, hey, you, you need to, to come back and work at the airport. You, need, you have, you know, night shifts, you have long hours and, and sometimes heavy jobs, but you just don't find those people. It's, it's, and I think that's our biggest challenge because the working conditions, because the salaries, I think should be reviewed just to make the sector attractive again. We, we're not attractive anymore. And I think that's the biggest challenge that many airports face. And it's not, not only the airports, it's, we also see it, for instance, with the border control, very difficult to find staff. So, I mean, that's the real challenge that we see. How do we make it attractive again? And of course, you can also think, next to, to getting people back, you know, probably think about automating some of these tasks that are not really you know, uh, attractive to employees, to workers, very repetitive, heavy. How can we automate more of these tasks? How we can digitize these tasks? I think that's one of the things we need to think about as an industry. But, but you know, the digitization is already very far. Like For some, it's, it's already goes too far. I'm sorry, I have even to check in my, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not about, my own suitcase I'm not now. talking about checking, because I, but are we about automating the operations. Yeah. Think about baggage. It's still a very manual process. You know, can we automate further? It's a very heavy process for the workers. So how can we help them? How can we automate more? Yeah. Because anyway, we don't find the people for these jobs. Yeah, it's definitely a topic, but you know, yeah. you know, on, on, on the people on the lowest scale and level of the chain, it's definitely an issue how to attract more people. But Florian, I know this morning they were looking at you. I'm looking again at you. You know, you're, you're at coast. You know, they're definitely not at the bottom of the scale, but they are seem... I understand that ground handles have a difficult and the shifts that they do. Of course, your guys have shifts too. But they seem to be kind of a discontented bunch there. You know, we were all... I'm, I'm sorry to say, or maybe a demanding bunch. But OK, you know, we all know that the French air traffic controllers love to strike in the summer. And there they were again last month. You know, so when is this going to stop? And they may strike, but please, when is it going to stop? Okay, how long, how long do you have? Because if you want me to give you oh, a no, lecture no, no, on French strike, I'm going to do that for four hours. You know, there okay, is the, uh, you, know, you no, get um, one minute and a half. <laughs> so, strangely enough, I will, I will probably defend them. Um, I think that they uh, came up uh, uh, with a reasonably uh, reasonable uh, request. Um, and uh, what happens is that we are in the system in France. I think it's probably typical to the French system where dialogue cannot, cannot take place until there is a strike, uh, at least for certain things. And this is exactly what happened. Then we have another speciality, which is we have a system which is called the minimum service, um, which is exactly what was triggered last week and which created this, uh, this chaos in the sky. Um, it's called minimum service because it's minimum. It doesn't say maximum service. Uh, and this is actually a protection to the system in case we have a, a major uh, a strike, but it doesn't work for what we call public strike, and there are more days of public strike in France than there are days in the year. So it gives you an order of magnitude of uh, what is at stake. <laughs> okay, well, I see Thomas, yeah. you know, being an unhappy you well, know, <laughs> user of your this, services. 
Florian knows this. I mean, uh, we've worked uh, very well together with Florian since the beginning of, uh, of A3. Uh, so minimum service. I mean, the whole discussion about, and it was mentioned this morning, uh, the, the, you know, one of the major problems we have is the, uh, the, um, the, the international flights that are not, not protected in this case. And it's very hard to talk about the minimum service and have to explain airlines. Our members had to cancel last week uh, not less than 1,000 flights. Uh, some of them, I know one particular airline that was hit just because of the strikes, ATC strike this summer, it had to cancel two-thirds of its flights. So how do you explain this to the passenger? So again, it puts the airlines in a very, a very, very difficult position. I think uh, just to, uh, I, I know Gustav Florian, you're you know, trying to do a good job also with for flight and, and it's good to invest uh, in the system. Uh, you could have maybe started to do a little bit earlier, but I know, I know your challenges. So, so my general criticism towards the NSPs, uh, some NSPs in Europe, is that they haven't really used the crisis, the downtime, to sufficiently invest into the system. And it's really, and it's really uh, that, that we see that today, uh, well, the summer, uh, peaking, you know, not even going over 2019, uh, a traffic that you know already we have a problem. Now I know I know the situation is there with Ukraine and his special situation, but the system is clearly not resilient. And um, investment should have been made. And I know some countries are better than others. Um, and of course, when you, in case of uh, of more traffic, uh, that uh, you need to cope with, and at the same time with uh, implementing full flight. Uh, you know, you've got a couple of bottlenecks together, uh, so the minimum crisis you have uh, or disruption in, in the traffic, we have a problem and we need to cancel flights. So we'd like to do anything, of course, working more closely together with NSPs, but the last thing, the last resort is actually cancelling flights. And certainly if we do it, uh, have to do it months in advance. Uh, and, uh, you know, it works, it's both on, on, the, on, the, AC, on the ATC uh, side, but uh, unfortunately this summer proved to be a special one with uh, the large European hub uh, airports yeah. causing issues. You know, Livia, you know, you wanted yeah. to comment. I, I think I, I feel the need to intervene because since the beginning of the conference there has been a big narrative being built around <laughs> strikes and strikes being the major... Uh, factor that has disrupted, disrupted European aviation. I think there are statistics from Eurocontrol that are very clear that the uh, uh, delays, the major delays are not caused by strikes, not at all, maybe in certain countries, but not in general. And I think that we should ask ourselves, why are there strikes? Strike is, strikes in most of the countries are very regulated, A strike is always the last resort for a union. So it's never something that is, it's never a decision that is taken, taken lightly. So if there are strikes, it's because there is no proper social dialogue. And one of the problems that characterized this summer's crisis is the lack of social dialogue. Decisions were taken during the crisis and after the crisis without involving the unions. So um, if uh, I'm, I decide to go uh, on a social dialogue just with one union out of five, then I have a problem. If I decide not to talk to my unions, if I decide not to tackle structural problems with the union, then there is a problem. We have worked together with the social partners at European level to develop a, a, a toolkit to address these questions, especially in air traffic management. And I'm sad that only one third of these measures are currently used. So, Let's not be surprised if there are strikes, and let's look, let's look at how to prevent strikes and at the root causes of strikes rather than blaming the workers for any delay. Well, I don't know blaming the workers, but you know there is something as a social dialogue which should be happening, and is also, of course, you know there was a major ramp up after a very difficult period. Maybe there were also a couple of opportunistic strikes, if I may call them. But let's steer away from from the strikes and let's say. Is, is this, was this a one-off because of the pandemic and the issues that came over? Or are we talking about a more, you know, the, 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 the agility, the flexibility? Are we talking about a more systemic issue that's, that's in the system that we should iron out? So I don't know, I'm just looking. Did, for example, the liberalization of certain services go too far? I'm just thinking about, you know, the ground handling and the thing. Would it be better if instead of this extreme outsourcing, we would go back to a certain level of in sourcing, it would also it would give airlines, if they would take over certain processes or airports, certain processes back in-house, it would give you better control of the process itself, you know, so it goes less wrong, less people to coordinate with. And it also will give the other people that start we're talking about making the jobs more attractive. For the people that start on the bottom, it gives more career opportunities to move up. You know, you have to, well, 
I don't know, did, did liberalization go, and, and Thomas, did it go a little too far? I'm not so sure. I mean, for instance, airports can also have their own handling operations. It's not forbidden, yeah, you know, yeah. and some airports do have, you know, handling activities, uh, and I think it's working well. Now, you know, it, it really depends on the context, but I think there are, you know, it's different, uh, you know, jobs, types of jobs, you know, managing an airport or, or, or doing handling activities are different jobs. So I, I personally, you know, believe more in a, in a, in a model where you, you, you're specialized in your own field and you can deliver, de deliver the best service. Now, as an airport uh, operator, of course, it introduces increased complexity. It would be a lot easier, as you say, if I would control, you know, the handlers, maybe the airlines, who knows, or the other way around, the airlines would control the airport, which is some, sometimes an ambition. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you know, you will still rely on, on, the, on the ecosystem. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are a lot of companies. You know, at the Brussels Airport, we have 320 companies operating at the airport. So you need, and you can't control all of them. Mm -hmm. So you need to organize, you need to work together as an ecosystem and define SLAs and define ways of working so that you can deliver the, the right service to, the, to the, the passenger. Because the passenger doesn't care if it's the airport airline handler. No, of course. He just wants the best service he pays for. Mm -hmm. And I think, so I'm, I'm, I'm really doubtful whether it would be a good idea to, to, to you know, in source more. I don't think it would be help the situation completely. Thomas, you don't seem convinced I'm, also. I'm, I'm with Arnaud on this. Uh, I think uh, I don't think it necessarily worked much better in the past. Uh, I think actually to some extent overall considered, I think it works better uh, thanks to liberalization of, of certain services. Um, uh, again, and I think airlines, 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 we need to do what we're good at. Uh, that is flying people from A to B in, in the best possible, uh, safe and best possible circumstances and, and in a very punctual manner. And, and this is why we will continue to, uh, uh, to work as partners together in this uh, famous ecosystem. Uh, we, we have no choice, but that's a good thing. We need to work together. We all have our own specialties. And as an airline, of course, we pay for a service. You expect uh, to get a service, uh, but uh, and it's also up to to co-define that service. And that depends from airport to airport. You can't yeah. uh, you can't say all airports are, are the same in Europe. It's definitely not true. So, so you know, I th I think the system aviation has been very good. You know, over time to learn, you know, has developed a good ability to to um, tackle crisis and to deal with it. But the crisis seems to be speeding up all the time. You know, look now how many crises together we're having. So some say we're almost in a kind of a perma-crisis. So as Florian says, so how do we bring this flexibility and agility in? And how do we prepare, I'm sorry, all the workers? Because, okay, now it's a little bit of a boom, but in the winter, it, we might be in recession. So workers, like companies, they have to... I just, there's nothing to do about it. You cannot have a fall. So how do you convince the workers that something like that is necessary? I think there's no secret. I think better working conditions, better salaries, more stability in the industry. Yeah, but do you accept there is an economic, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's, but that's, that's why yeah. if the ecosystem is not working and the pressure is being put just on one part of the industry or one part of the industry is putting pressure on all the the companies or all the other parts that are providing services that there's no way if the the margins for a company are tiny of course there's no way to improve working conditions so what we need to do we need to establish a level playing field where for instance within the airport there are collective bargaining agreements and workers are paid conditions that are bargained with the unions it's no secret you know in 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 those airports where in those countries where workers weren't fired during covid because there were support measures from government there was less of a problem during the summer in the us there was less of a problem during the summer so it's it's no rocket science i don't know i was i was in the us and there was a lot of problems you know so <laughs> less with shortage of uh, workers it Airports for sure. Oh, yeah, you know. So um, we touched upon this this morning. You know, the single European sky. We all notice it's a necessity. It's not there. Florian, I am so sorry. I'm looking at you again. You know, but there we are. Fine. So we we are a very you're a well known person here in Brussels. You worked here at your control. Then you know you were the head of Cesar Seju. You cannot be working in Brussels without an ATM without being committed single European sky. Well, uh, yes, well, big, big sigh, you know, no, no, from no, you, fine. from me, you know. So you <laughs> work now on, for, you I'm know. I'm just trying to speak. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. But so my question is not yet coming. Okay. You know, so Go ahead. That, you know. <laughs> so um, you're now the head of the French NSP, you know, and your employer, your boss, is a little bit less committed to single European sky than 
maybe you are. So how does that work? How do you gel those two? I don't think you can put it like that. I mean, the oh. single Euro first of all, the single European sky does exist. Uh, everything that I do is in this context. No, but I think we, we here in Brussels undermine the power of what we have already today. Uh, and honestly, it can work. It does work. It can deliver probably more than what we think it can. And OK, uh, I'm not going to go through the, the CES 2 plus evolution. But already with what we have today, we can do a number of things. Um, we can drive performance, for instance. Um, we can drive cost in certain direction. We can uh, perform network coordination. All these kind of things, we do them already today. There are things um, which um, I'm not sure are going to be addressed by uh, the CES 2 Plus. There are things related to the volatility of the traffic, for instance, we are uh, managing. Uh, I'm relying in France uh, with uh, rules of engagement of my air traffic controllers that have been defined in 2002. Okay, so they are 20 years um, ago, they were carved in stone in the French law. So now, today, they are not really adapted to the kind of traffic we are dealing with. This is not going to be addressed by the single European sky. It's part of the French law, whether the CES 2 plus changes anything or not, it's not going to impact that. That's a social dialogue which needs to take place within France, with the workers, with the controllers, because we are going to need them at times where they were not needed in the first place uh, initially when these rules were uh, created. So uh, I think there's part of it which has to rely on what the NSPs can do internally, what they can do in the context of existing rules uh, within the success as it exists today. Again, the performance scheme, the network manager. But there are things, of course, where we need to go beyond. There are things where we need to work together on flows of traffic across uh, the airspace changes to the airspace, changes as well to the systems that we are using to make them more interoperable. For sure, a change of the regulatory framework will force things onto us. On the other hand, I think we all acknowledge today that we have to move ahead, regardless whether success 2 plus will become a reality or not. And I have no crystal ball, and I have no uh, strong opinion about it, to be uh, frank. Um, I think we can do much better with what we have already today. I just mentioned two examples to, to, uh, to show you uh, how I think we can work uh, better. First example, we implemented one year ago the free route airspace uh, yeah. in France, in half of the airspace. That was a major change, nothing to do with the single European skies. That's the work that has been done in coordination with Eurocontrol, in coordination with other states, in coordination with the airlines. Yeah. Our controllers have been trained, they are working on it, and they are happy to work on it because they feel they are contributing to the sustainability issue. Second element, and this is maybe something to think about uh, when we enter into the uh, RP4, uh, we have targets, targets related to the delay and the performance we perform in that context. These targets, we never meet them, never ever. Uh, even in, in the months of December, January, February, where we have low traffic, we don't even reach those targets. I think this is a stupidity because I do not hear any airline complaining or any airport complaining during this period of time that there is chaos in the sky, that there is too much delay or whatsoever. What I mean by this is that we set targets which we know are not going to be achieved and it doesn't help to improve the system. So this is something where we don't need the CES 2 plus, this is something we can address in the next RP4 for instance, which will put the right focus in terms of having targets on which we can work with the controllers, work with the system to say, let's deliver onto those targets. Let's not have targets which from the beginning we know we are not going to achieve. This is the first thing you learn in management. Don't measure things and set targets which are useless. And, and despite of this, this is what we keep doing. Thomas, I, did I see you say yes? I, no? I think Florian should be starting a roadshow and talk yeah. to colleagues in, <laughs> in Europe. Uh, no, there's some very good ideas and, and I know the uh, the difficult situation uh, many leaders of NSPs are in. There is a whole political backlog and background because when you talk about CES2+, you're talking about legislation, you're talking about uh, politicians uh, getting involved or not involved. You know, It's a very complex issue, so it's a challenge uh, for us and, and, and for the NSPs also to explain to respective ministers, this is why we're doing this. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of opportunities currently missed at the political level. Uh, and I think also because it's a complex issue. And uh, I think politicians have the perception, oh, don't change a winning team or don't change anything that works. Uh, and they don't seem to think that, it, you know, we're getting, uh, we need more capacity going forward. We, we heard Willie saying this morning, 
uh, optimistic or not, I mean, they didn't want to pin down on numbers. Uh, I think really did, but, but we are growing as a sector, which is positive. But we need to foresee the capacity, and that also goes for some of the airports, which have uh, challenges with regards to infrastructure, new runways, and so on. Uh, but also, it's, it's not a secret. It's coming to us that in airspace we have a capacity issue uh, and that we need to find solutions. But in order to get it, take it to the next level, we need to get CES2, CES2 Plus approved. So I think we need to do a better job, including ourselves, to explain politicians what is here at risk. Um, but again, for I think most politicians, it's, it's the problem for tomorrow and after tomorrow, and it's not something they'd like to deal with uh, today, unfortunately. Yeah. No, I know, a short-term problem, or not a problem, an issue for you. One of your main competitors, a little bit more north, is not in a very good state. You know, they don't seem to be able to handle a lot of traffic. Now, we have this saying in, in Flemish, you know, um, one man's debt is not a man's bread. Their problems are very good for you, you know. Um, well, first of all, they are not only our, comp they are not only competitors, they are our friends. So we, oh. no, Mr. <laughs> I mean, we, you know. I always heard that airports compete for traffic, so. <laughs> yeah, we sometimes do, but we, we also uh, have to, to take in consideration what's happening there. It's not, it's not an easy situation. I, I'm not going to talk about that. It's not my, you know, my scope. But nevertheless, I think your question, we, do we get, you know, Dutch people here, more Dutch people? Yes, we do. So you benefit. Uh, we have some benefits, and, and, and we, we discussed that last year already uh, internally, and, and, and the question was, we should we pro be proactive? Because you know uh, there was already problems, uh, and we said, look, let's let's not let's not import the problems in Brussels, because we we wanted to make sure that we had a sustainable sustainable mm -hmm. operations. So basically, what we are doing now is we are helping you know the uh, the airlines uh, you know that are already client with us, you know like TUI, you know is moving some of its flights from from Schiphol to to Brussels in in October, or other some other airlines that are already our our, our clients because we know that we you know we have a relationship we have a sustainable uh, relationship with them. Uh, but we're not going to, to, to do some, you know, cherry picking and, and in Schiphol. I don't think it's, it makes sense uh, for us. Uh, we just want to make sure that we deliver, you know, quality service uh, and then we step by step grow our, our activity back to the 2019 level. But we know it's not for, uh, for tomorrow. Yeah. But, but Amsterdam also has, uh, you know, some other issues too, besides, you know, being able to handle the passengers. Uh, the passenger flows, the government seems to be steadfast in its idea or, you know, to reduce the size of, of Amsterdam, put a cap on, on the flight movements. Do you see the same problem coming over here? Some political parties are putting a cap on passenger movements and it's probably, you know, also a tendency in other European airports too. It, it's, the, it's, it's the discussion connectivity versus sustainability. Well, first of all, I think it's a, it's a very big decrease, 15% that is contemplated in, 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 in Amsterdam. Yeah, I think it's, it's, still, it's still under discussion, so probably too yeah. early to, to draw conclusions. Yeah. Uh, but it's a lot, and it happens very fast. So uh, I think we should also think about the consequences on, on the economy, on, on jobs, and mm -hmm. so on. Um, what we say here in, you know, at our airport and what we discuss with our, our government is say we can reduce flights, you know, short distance flights. You know, we, I think it makes sense. You know, why do we still have flights Brussels Schiphol or Brussels Paris? You know, these days you could you could do that by train. But the issue is we, we don't have in Brussels a high speed train going to the airport. So we used to have one during several years because mm -hmm. the airport financed it for a while. Then we said, okay, we, it's not our job. So we, we did the test, it works. Now it's up to the, the, the railway and, and, and the state to, to take care of it. And they said they don't have money for that. And I think that's the, the biggest challenge that we are facing is the connectivity between air, airplanes and trains. Mm -hmm. We think there's a lot of things to be done there. Uh, you know, and that's, I think, the clever way to, to reduce some flights on the short distance while yeah. keeping the flights where alternatives uh, do not exist. Yeah, you know, Florian, they're doing that in France, right? You know, they're trying to reduce short-haul flights, everything up to 500 kilometers. But in the longer term, if we, I'm not saying I'm for it, you know, it's a political decision, but it will reflect on your traffic you have to handle. Once again, the flexibility, the agility that we were talking about. Yeah, again, again what we see is, is, is that the traffic patterns are changing. Uh, they are changing for the other flights, but they are changing as well for the national traffic. I think what, one key to the uh, intermodality that has just been mentioned is, is the predictability of the system, because if we want to have proper interconnection, we cannot afford to have a you know, hicks up in the system, whether it is on the train side, or on the uh, airport side, or on the airline side, or on the ATM side. Again, this needs to work properly together. That's, that's clear. And therefore, the level of uh, 
performance we will need to deliver as a NSP will be directly as well uh, measurable in terms of impact on how this works together. Yeah, you know, so a different topic and to come back to the bad summer. It was a bad summer for delays for passengers, you know, they, the airlines, the brand financially comes on, on you, on, on the airlines, Thomas. Yes. Uh, passenger regulation, it's very strong uh, in, in Europe, the compensation of it. Um, uh, how much did your carriers have to pay this summer? Do you have a clue? I don't have the exact numbers, but it's, you make actually good points uh, when we're looking at, uh, for instance, the, some of the airport situations. Uh, I don't think it's simply fair that the airlines have to shoulder all the, the burden, uh, including also the financial burden. Um, again, because if we can cancel way in advance, we can try to give people an alternative, uh, try to rebook, etc. Uh, but if, if cancellations have to take place uh, really short term, then we have a problem. And of course, there's also the financial impact. Um, uh, I don't have an exact idea what this summer, but I can tell you that um, the last 10 years, the costs uh, uh, under EU 261 um, have um, almost quadrupled uh, for airlines. Um, so this is a trend. Uh, I think it also has to do with the fact there is more, um, more knowledge uh, from, uh, from the passenger what the rights are, which is a good thing. Uh, and also, of course, the impact of the, what we call the ambulance chasers. The lawyers are actually making money, getting a commission uh, for going to the airlines and, and for you know, creating these wonderful court cases, which is a lose-lose for everyone at the end of the day. Um, but yes, I mean, the trend is that the cost of uh, U261 for us is, is, is going up. And of yeah. course, this summer surely must not have helped for that. Yeah. You know, so the, uh, the, the U, uh, EU 261 is up for revision. Are, are there talks to, 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 is it going in the right direction for airlines? Or, well, it's already a long time in revision, I agree with you. But, you know, maybe the way I understand from the Commission, they're bringing it back up. Is, is there any talks and openness to, to share the burden a little bit more? Because Okay, when it's an airline's fault, you pay. But once in a while, it's also an air traffic controller's fault, or I mean, you know, a union's fault, or a ground handler's fault. So you know, to share this yeah. kind of burden would be fair. Uh, in interesting thought. It could be Pandora's box, <laughs> but uh, I think if we would just get EU two six one right, if we could get back on the table, uh, and I, I know uh, from our discussions from, uh, with the European Consumers Organization is uh, they would also be not against getting it back on the table because they also realize that transparency and certainty for the passenger in this case is of uh, critical importance rather than uh, 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 not uh, contact the airline if there's an issue but then via via and so on so which just adds to more, more, uh, more frustration. So I think the, the, the key is there is a piece of legislation that needs to be revised, that the Commission made ready to be revised. It's on the, on the Council's table. Well, it's not because they took it off. Uh, because of Gibraltar many years ago now, it sounds like ages ago. Um, but you know, this is as A4E, we, we call upon every single presidency for the last couple of years to bring it back on the table, at least to discuss it, uh, and then bring the parties back to the table, because then mm -hmm. have a discussion on even taking into account the last couple of years, what have we learned, what does this mean in context of EU 261. But as long as the Council is not willing to do that, I think it will be um, bad for uh, both passengers and airlines. Mm -hmm. So let's try to get that right uh, before we look at alternative solutions. I'm not saying that in some cases, in, with some airports, some locations, that airlines are not approaching the airports. Uh, I think there's a, a couple of those known um, that are willing then to, to compensate. Yeah. Fine. Well. But it doesn't uh, going to resolve the structural issue we have with E261. Yeah, yeah. You, Olivia, I saw you shaking your head. You were not agreeing that the burden should be shared. I, I'm, I'm just saying you mentioned the union. As far as I know, uh, force majeure is not uh, covered. So no, no, no. Maybe no, when I there mean, are strikes, you know, airlines do not have to know, compensate. Exactly. So. But it's not always, it's always the airlines have to compensate. I think some yeah, airports have to compensate. Yeah, but in case no of strike, airlines you know. do not have to compensate. No, no, no. I do agree with you. But let's take it in the wider context, you know, that all groups should be taking some responsibility. No, sustainability is very important in the aviation sector. Uh, we heard, you know, just Thorsten was talking, we all know, I know, the importance of, we all know the importance of SAF, um, your Brussels airport. You are fortunate and not fortunate. You're on the pipelines of NATO and those guys don't want SAF in their pipelines. How are you solving that? 
Well, first of all, indeed, we are fortunate to have the, pe the pipeline. I think yes. that's always been very useful. And I think we, you know, at this stage, we, you know, it's not possible to put stuff in, in, in this pipeline. Uh. I don't think the, 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 the last word has been said. So I think the, the, it's, of course, something that needs to be discussed where we need to, you know, realize it's the evolution. And we, we heard Torsten explaining, you know, the, the potential of, of SAF going forward. I think it would be a pity if we cannot have SAF in, uh, in the pipeline itself and that we have to have trucks. To bring to bring stuff to the airport, which obviously pollutes more than, than just using uh, using the, the pipeline. So I think we are very, uh, uh, you know, very much pushing to, to get that uh, that pipeline open for for SAF going forward. As because because we are working hard on, on getting SAF at the airport. Uh, where we you know we have launched a, a, an initiative with uh, you know called Stargate, which is supported by the European Union. Uh, you know, to introduce SAF you know, at, at the airport to have our own blending machine on site. Uh, and, and make sure that we can indeed, as fast as we can, provide you know higher uh, ratios of, of, of blending in, in, in to, the, to the aircrafts. And I think that's really the, the way forward as we see it. And so I'm, I'm sure it, it will take some time to, to, to convene everyone, but I'm sure we will yeah. be there in the end. Thomas? Yeah. Yes, just to, to pick on that point, uh, on the SAF situation in Brussels, which is very pe peculiar situation with, with the NATO pipeline. I just would like to remind everyone that uh, now see Olivier here in front of me and Tanya uh, from Canzo, is that um, we still have a very active group around Destination 2050. So they were all working together, including when we talk about SAF, but mainly on policy and, re and uh, policy, how to get to net zero by 2050. So we're still a very active group, uh, the five association of us. So this is a clear example where it's also in our interest to make sure that in Brussels we have sufficient SAF, uh, we have sufficient... Uh, available, um, available f uh, fuel available uh, going forward. Just to remind everyone, so on the environment front, um, we, we're very, uh, as a community, very actively, very much alive, uh, and we hope to do a lot more uh, good things from a sustainability perspective, because this is, again, a, a topic which is fundamental how we can um, get to net zero together. Yeah. Uh, and each of us, we have a particular role, particular situation, of course, the main onus is on the airlines because that's where the, most of the emissions come from. But also, airports have a role to play. ANSP is, of course, Canzo. Um, so, just for the record, uh, to, you know that we have a very good cooperation. Yeah. In yeah. That if I can ask you, all four of you one quick question and a short answer, what's the main challenge for the coming winter for you? Well, I think for us is to fix working conditions and to retain, attract and retain yeah. people in the airlines. And as I said, uh, work on uh, on disruptions for workers like uh, violence levels. That's oh, yeah, something on which we are asking topic for about commitments. It, but yes, seems to be a major topic. I hear this from so, airlines. Yeah. So, so it's we have to do something. But I think Ayata is definitely working on that too. You know, trying to solve that. I don't know your main challenge for the coming winter. I would say two. Sorry, two. Uh, okay. Well, the main one is resilience. No, it's really short. Yeah, yeah. Resilience of our yeah. operations. Make sure that we, we can deliver a service. And two is sustainability. It's not. It's only short term. Obviously, it's long term. But I think the two key challenges. Okay, great, Thomas. I would say, uh, yes, not that I want to copy Arno, but uh, unsurprisingly, it's, uh, uh, you know, resilience or, uh, and, and I would say also predictability, especially I'll explain why in the network, but also at airports in terms of capacity uh, that, we, that we can actually act, um, uh, which airlines usually are very quick to act, but we need to be able to uh, act uh, way in advance before the passenger gets hurt. Florian. And for me, that will be to prepare next summer. Uh, we will do a lot of work this winter to, to prepare for that, to have a, hopefully a more efficient system. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. It was wonderful having you on the panel. You know, great. I'm sorry, I didn't want me to, to talk about the strikes. I missed, you know. <laughs> By the way, Florian, starting from tomorrow, right? <laughs> so we've heard, we've heard uh, from this very interesting panel. I think again, Kathy and and the colleagues which were on the panel, uh, the, the the fact that there was a lot of pressure on the workers. Allow me again to highlight one point which was raised by the Eurocontrol Director General. We went from 30% to 90% very steeply. And the, the system was always very, very safe. I think this is an asset due to the professionalism that we have in this sector. And it's an asset that we absolutely need to protect going forward. It's the baseline where to, to create. We also heard that we have systemic problems, that uh, probably not everyone was following the Euro control forecast. I think that's a very important lesson learned. And we also heard how can we manage this lack of scalability that we still have at this stage. And one answer that, that 
I think with Eurocontrol, we will work also hard with all the partners is really to plan very well, to start ahead of time, but also to discipline then work together to implement the plans that we'll need, especially for next summer, in order to have a much better year. And we've been discussing around the corridors. Of course, we might afford 2022 because it was a ramping up, but next year we will definitely not be able to afford a failure. We talked a lot about the, the existing uh, regulatory framework, and I think it's something that we all need to, uh, let's say, follow, which was said by Florian around the importance of the existing regulation, how we can deliver more within the existing regulation, of course, working hard for the future improvements. Uh, we also heard about the importance connected to that of the industry, again, taking more leadership. This is happening, but we need to boost it. And of course, we heard a lot of alternative solutions like capping the traffic, and like, of course, multimodality, uh, especially in the... And these are things which are going to happen, but also need to be complementary and not substituting our business. And of course, I think uh, the, the other discussions on the SAF and the, and the regulatory framework on the U261 were also very important, also to address the fact that these things need to be tackled very, very quickly. Now, we're going to move to the airports. Our next speaker is Oliver Jankovic. So, you know, Oliver I, uh, Jankovic is the Director General of ACI Europe, representing more than 500, 500 airports in 55 countries. So, who better than you can tell us what the airports Get are the going to do? the numbers right. Thank you, Jacopo. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to Iman and all his team for uh, putting this fantastic event and, and having us there. Um, I was asked to present about the challenges facing airports, and of course, uh, most of the day, and especially the last panel, has been very much about that. I think we found ourselves uh, more in the news than we would have wished over the summer. So what I'd like now is to, to move on a step and uh, try to, to take a more helicopter view, looking at challenging challenges in, in the longer term, at a more strategic level and how this is uh, already reshaping uh, the business strategy of, of our members across Europe. So, of course, now it's very much about turning the, COVID, the, the corner from, from the COVID pandemic, uh, but indeed with a lot of, of challenges, both immediate and long term. Looking at traffic, we are seeing passenger volumes recovering. You can see in August, 14% for the EU plus market, which includes the UK. So getting very close to, to 19 levels. Although if we look year to date, January to August, uh, we're still minus 25% in the, in the EU plus market. I think what is uh, quite striking is how the smaller and regional airports have been outperforming in this recovery compared to larger airports and hubs. That's not uh, so much a surprise because, of course, we know Asia is uh, still close, part of it, and that's impacting, in particular, the performance of the larger hubs. And, of course, that reflects the fact that the recovery still remains very much driven by intra-EU demand, uh, leisure, and VFR traffic. I think what is also striking is that, although we're speaking about a recovery, there's a, a lot of divergence in the performance between national markets, as we can see with actually three national markets having exceeded in August uh, their passenger traffic volumes of, of 2019. That's Luxembourg, Greece, and, and Iceland. And more generally, we see those markets serving tourism destinations also performing better. And of course, there you can see also the impact of the war in Ukraine, with in particular airports in Finland and, and Latvia uh, being very much uh, impacted. Of course, uh, operational challenge with the volume surge beating expectation. This has been commented quite a bit. Uh, I think these numbers are interesting to realize the sudden surge in volume. This is compared to last year. We can see almost three times the volume of traffic we had to deal with, with some markets being really seeing a, a, a tremendous increase in traffic uh, over one year, like the UK and, and Ireland. Uh, of course, acute staff shortage and, and strikes impacting all actors uh, and resulting in significant disruptions. Um, but it's clear that there's, there's more than meets the eyes on this, and we've tried to, 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 to look at this in the previous panel. And I think down the line, uh, one important aspect that we need to take into account is that this also reflects differences in how states decided to support or not support their airports and ground handlers. 
Beyond these difficult ramp issues, of course, we now have war in Europe, um, a war which is there to stay, probably, with worrying threats uh, for the future. Uh, that war is, of course, first and foremost impacting our Ukrainian airport members, which have lost all commercial traffic and which are trying to survive. But for all airports, I think the impact of the war over time will come from renewed supply pressures. Supply pressures were already a worry before the war, during the recovery from COVID, because of the fact that network airlines had downsized significantly, because of the impact of airport slot waivers. But now, of course, we get a spike in jail fuel costs affecting all airlines, as well as the appreciation of, of the dollar. And that will make probably airlines more risk averse over time in terms of how much capacity they will be ready to put in the market. Already we're seeing increasing in airfares. Again, that was also a trend uh, before the war. It's, it's getting worse and there's probably more to come. So that obviously trans translates into new demand pressures as we go into the winter. Uh, apart from airfares, I think these demand pressures are coming from the wider macroeconomic impact of, of the war. And I'm taking here about disruptions to supply chain and global trade, which are impacting uh, an increasing number of sectors. Inflation, of course, hitting out households. In the EU, in inflation last month was at 10%. In some markets, it's very high, like in the Baltics, over 20%, or the Netherlands, 17%. And of course, this means that at the moment, uh, we're seeing a record drop in consumer and business confidence. So all that means down the line, increased downward traffic risk. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty as to how the market will behave this winter and into next year. And I think this is part of the reasons why we still see a full recovery for passenger traffic volumes at Europe's airport only in 2024. Looking ahead, I think we clearly see a new aviation paradigm with changes in demand. I think the, the jury is still out as to how much demand has changed through the pandemic. Uh, the market has not yet stabilized, but there are distincting new patterns that have come out from COVID and that are accelerating. The fact that leisure and VFR demand is king, this has clearly given a boost to those carriers, but interestingly also a boost to premium traffic for network carriers on leisure routes. Demand is also turning greener uh, with trends like slow tourism and an increasing willingness of travelers to lessen their environmental impact. Um, this, of course, is increasingly the case for corporates. I think uh, business travel is coming at a slower pace and uh, clearly corporate travel will increasingly be decided on sustainability criteria. This reflects pressures from investors, shareholders, and customers. And that's also evidenced by the recent launch by t &E of a ranking of companies based on their commitment and action to reduce corporate travel. Down the line, I think clearly uh, demand growth will be less domestic, less European, and more international. And that simply reflects differences in the propensity to fly with the European market, the EU market in particular, being, of course, a very mature market. Changes in demand, along with new aircraft technology, will also impact air connectivity. The report we published last June, which measures the connectivity of all of Europe's airports, shows that air connectivity is still very much being impacted by the crisis and suffering in the recovery. We were, as of June, still at 29% uh, Sorry, in terms of, of uh, be below 2019 in terms of overall con air connectivity levels. But what is interesting, I think, is to see how actually the recovery in direct connectivity is, is really beating the recovery in indirect and, and hub connectivity. But our new aviation paradigm will also see, will also see increasing airline dominance very clearly. Uh, I, has to, I have to ask to, uh, to Josef if he wants to be on the picture next time, maybe. Uh, but um, clearly looking at uh, the capacity that airlines have put this summer into the European airport market, it's very clear that the ultra-low-cost carriers are the winners. The figures are, are very impressive. I think it's interesting to note also that the Gulf carriers have been lagging behind in terms of the capacity they've put in the European market, and that's, of course, a direct result of the ongoing travel restrictions to, to Asia. For the winter, uh, this is pretty much the, the same picture. 
So I think what we are seeing is that ultra low cost carriers are very well positioned beyond the pandemic for the current impact of the war, but also the prospect of a recession. Why is that? Well, because we know that when there's inflation, consumers are trading down. <coughs> These carriers have a very, very young fleet, which acts as a natural hedge against higher fuel prices. They've been upgoging and constantly lowering their unit cost. They have broadened their network. They have penetrated primary airports. And last but not least, they have a massive order for new aircraft to come in their fleet in the coming years. Meanwhile, network carriers have retrenched. They've been heavily supported, as we all know, and they're also restricted. But for the moment, they are chasing yields. They are not chasing volumes and putting capacity in the market as we would like. Down the line, of course, airline conciliation is still on the cards, although at the moment it is happening more by attrition than anything else. We have the example of Czech Airlines being done to just a few aircraft, SIS having filed for bankruptcy protection in the US, and Blue Air having stopped operating. So all of this taking together for Europe's airline, airports means only one thing, increased airport competition. We're about to release a new study uh, from Frontier Economics, which analyzes and substantiates the development of airport competition. But already you can see from those quotes from Reuters about EasyJet or even from the Lufthansa press release, I think they serve to illustrate something that regulators still tend to ignore largely. But beyond structural changes in aviation, I think it's very important as businesses that we also look at the big picture. Because what we're seeing coming up and acting at the moment is really new fundamentals that will have a profound impact on Europe's airports and, and beyond. First and foremost, this is about living and traveling with COVID. Uh, I don't think we can say we're done yet with the pandemic. This is about much more instable geopolitics. Um, we can see that history is back with a vengeance and that security is increasingly driving decision making from governments all of which in turn is putting an end to globalization as we've known it. And for now, of course, we are in the war economy, which means uncharted territory. And of course, besides all this, we have the existing threat of global warming. I think the issue we all agree is no longer with that we can avoid climate change, but how and whether we can adapt and whether we can do this at sufficient speed. I think the recent report on the climate tipping points, which shows those tipping points may be much closer than what we thought, is, is another warning there. So the big picture for aviation and airports is all about disruptions and volatility, the prospects of slower traffic growth compared to what we've been used to, and of course the questions of societal relevance. And this means that as airports, of course, we have to manage more uncertainty, more risk, and more complexity. And in that context, there are really two key challenges that are standing out for airports. The first one is about new airport economics. Clearly, through COVID, we are still in a situation of systemic financial weakness for airports. Airports in Europe have lost 20 billion euro over the past two years, and with much less financial support than what some airlines could get, airports have no choice but that to pile on debt you can see here more than 60 billion increase in debt and liabilities for airports in the continent since 2019. This is massive. And for now, of course, the recovery tends to be more cost intensive and revenue weak. And we do face structural revenue pressures now because of slower volume growth going forward, because of increasing airline dominance, as I have explained and also because of digital competition when it comes to retail and our non-aeronautical revenues. And those structural revenue pressures are now combining with structural cost increases, with inflation, of course, hitting our operating cost and capex, energy and staff cost amount to 45% of our cost. I was discussing over the lunch break with one of our member, airport member, who told me that in August alone, their energy bill equated what they had paid in 2019 for the whole year. So this is putting a lot of pressure on the cost side. And that clearly is all challenging the airport economic model because our economic model is driven and depending on the assurance of continued 
volume growth, which we know we're not going to get in the future. And that is exposing airports to an investment crunch. Our big worry is how are we going to restore our ability to keep investing for the future. We've seen Europe's airports already decreasing their investment by 7 billion over the past years. Our second key challenge is, of course, about decarbonization and societal ac acceptability. I think it's very clear that this is coming with significant policy and regulatory risk, and we're starting to see some of this materializing. The decision of the Dutch government to reduce capacity at Schiphol is, is the primary example there. So increasingly, it's just not about our license to grow in the future, but our license to keep operating. The EU is going through a necessary and unprecedented policy and regulatory reset through Fit for 55, and we know that this will impact the economics of aviation. The report we commissioned to Oxera shows that very clearly. But more broadly, addressing the challenge of decarbonization and sustainability will also condition our access to finance, our access to human capital, and I think we all know that the risk of not moving forward are, are very clear to hold. So addressing, of course, the challenge of decarbonization is going to be largely done to solving the precedent challenge I mentioned, uh, resetting airports' economics. And that means that as airports, we have no option than to transition and transform. And that means shaping our future, which is going to be not just about embracing ESG, environment, social and government, but really pivoting towards a new value creation model for airports, where less can actually be more, when we go back to longer term planning horizons, and when we focus on connectivity with positive externalities, while looking whenever possible at new business opportunities. This new value creation model for airports can only be based on three pillars. It's about sustainability, innovation and diversification, and I'll go briefly through each of them. On sustainability, of course, this is about our license to exist, and not just as businesses, but as humans. And we have no alternative than to lead, as the CEO of BlackRock has made very clear. So this is why Europe's airports are accelerating decarbonization. Uh, the airport community has reaffirmed its commitment to net zero last year. And we see an increasing number of airports actually setting their targets to 2030 already or even earlier. And all of this, of course, is underpinned by the groundwork and tangible action of airports under airport carbon accreditation. And I'd like to thank here very much Eamon and Eurocontrol for their continued support for, for our program. But increasingly, this is not just about those CO2 emissions that we control directly as airports, the scope one and scope two. It's going to be about what we can do to help airlines reduce their own emissions, the scope three emissions. This is why, of course, we've been involved together with A4E, Kenso, and ASD in Destination 2050. Why we've just published also guidance for our members on what they can do to reduce scope three emissions. And also why we have recently partnered with Airbus to facilitate the development of new energy at airports. All this, of course, is going to be core to our business transformation to drive this new value creation based on a holistic approach within the airport, of course, beyond the airport site as well, which will mean for airports extending the scope of their activities, but also accepting an extension of the scope of their responsibilities. Ultimately, it involves moving from being airports to what we call airports. That means rethinking capacity and connectivity, not just in aeronautical terms, but in terms of the clean energy capacity and deployment, not just for the airport users, but for our communities and our regions. It also means looking at sustainability across the board, deepening further community relationship, which is really what we're seeing airports across Europe doing at the moment. Turning to innovation, this is about operational performance and resilience. We've spoken a lot already about all of that. Uh, but clearly, both operational performance and resilience are key to the competitive position of each airport because it's linked also to the ability to attract and retain airline business over time. The great enablers here are obviously digital, artificial intelligence and automation. This is about enabling more seamless flows for passengers and bags 
This is about moving into more predictive operations and maintenance. This is about more stakeholder integration. This is about new business opportunities and, as ever, about security, health, and, and safety. I think what is really interesting is that to drive this innovation agenda, airports are increasingly looking at being co-creators and investors and not just buyers of ready-made solutions. This is why we can see now most of the major airports in Europe creating their innovation lab. And of course there, the challenge is going to be about scalability and standardization. But this is why also we see airports together with ACI Europe firmly involved and committed to CESAR. Coming to the last pillar, and I'm going to be done, um, diversification. This is about economic performance and quality. On the aeronautical side, the quest of airports to diversify the airline route portfolio and their connectivity. Still investing, of course, but differently. Less in capacity, more in sustainability, maintenance, and operational performance. And that clearly requires a long overdue regulatory alignment on the side of the airport charges, of course, and I know Thomas will not like this, but we need to move more decisively towards the user pace principle and give airlines more pricing freedom that reflects really the market conditions. On slots as well, the flexibility that airlines can have when it comes to slot allocation results in wasted capacity. It's time to review the rules. And on the non-aeronautical side, diversification is going to be increasingly about quality, hospitality, and brand equity. This is what all airports are working around in Europe. Evolving their offering and their services around the three pillars of sustainability, customization, and experience. Trying to do more cross-selling and cooperate even with the airlines to develop the non-aeronautical revenues, something that is not yet done. And of course, looking beyond the passenger. Finally, for some airports, whenever possible, it is about also going international. Europe is home to major airport groups that have become global leaders in airport development and management. They are exporting their know-how, they are diversifying their revenues, but I think they are doing something that is a little bit overlooked as well. They are acting as champions of climate actions beyond Europe. So increasingly, I think we, we're seeing our members, our airports across Europe, working around those strategic directions of sustainability, innovation, and diversification. And we have very recent examples, actually, of how airports are embracing this and charting the way forward, acting as global businesses, providing value for all their stakeholders. This is the case of Aeroporti di Roma with the Careport. This is the case of the new strategic plan of Aeroport de Paris, Pioneers. And very close to here, of course, the new strategic plan, Shift 2027 of Brussels Airport. But of course, we need to make sure these ambitious and transformative agendas are enabled by our policy makers and regulators, so that down the line, no airport and community is left behind. I think the future of regional air connectivity is very much in doubt. And of course, this is a key challenge that we as ACI Europe are working on. And we're committing to address that, of course, uh, for and with our members, and of course, with our stakeholders in the industry and uh, in the Brussels scene. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Oli very much, Olivier, uh, for your very detailed presentation, but also very illuminating on the challenges that the airports have ahead of them and the, the importance to move the economic model forward. Uh, I would now pass to the, one of the most, uh, our final speaker, but also on a very important thread of the military part uh, regarding the integration of with the Ukrainian war, uh, Mr. General uh, Karsten Stoye. So, hello. We're gonna deliver the full cooperation between civil and military, <laughs> right? Excellent. Thank you very much, Jacopo. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a privilege, an honor, and for sure the pleasure to brief about civil-military cooperation with the main effort on the military side. I don't know what you did on the 24th of February when the war in Ukraine started. I was in Helsinki visiting the chief of the Air Force Finland and representatives from the ANSP, 
Finland and Finnair. And right away, it came to us and said, oh, this will have a big impact, right? Sanctions, embargo, and as far as aviation is concerned, closing of air space for the Russian airlines, but then the concern from Finnair closing Russian airspace. And then on the horizon, we saw fuel prices raising. We saw inflation. We didn't see the uh, economy war that we have in the moment, the energy war. But for sure, we saw there will be a mindset change in the European population as far as security is concerned. And when we saw that, in this very day, it was very hard to predict for us, you know, the future. Right away, the military side reacted on the, on the eastern part uh, of Europe, trying to establish new airspaces for air policing aircraft, support aircraft, and so on. And this was done in conjunction with Eurocontrol, the network manager, did an excellent job in facilitating this. But one thing was true also. Because we were in a pre-crisis situation, nobody called a real crisis, nor NATO, not any nation. There were no crisis response measures. So everything was done in direct relation to the individual nation. A lot of synchronization was necessary. And uh, we had a lot of lessons identified out of this, out of this uh, uh, beginning of the war. And we are trying now here at Eurocontrol to facilitate this for the future. What was also done, and I'm missing my slides here, I don't know, do we have slides here? Someone? Okay, so I have to push the button, okay. <laughs> so, doesn't work. I'm okay? Oh, okay. I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry to hear it. <coughs> then I have to go back. So the NATO nations came together in the Madrid summit, and the outcome was a new NATO strategy. To look into the future, and this is what is called new normal. New normal also means an advanced vigilant posture and vigilant activities in the eastern part. And we saw a lot of more airspaces, a lot of more activities uh, in the eastern part. And here is an example what NATO uh, 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 give out, you know, for the, for the populations, for our uh, uh, people to see. And the demand in airspace is much higher than we will see. And this will remain in the future. What I saw in my last year here during uh, my new position, I talked to several air chiefs to several Air National Service provider leadership, and it was clear to me that in the past it was really stovepipe thinking that we had as far as aviation and airspaces in Europe was concerned. I talked, for instance, to the uh, chairman of the Avi uh, Aviation Navigation Commission of the ICAO, and he asked me the question, Carsten, how is it possible that you guys are, you know, talking different language? We don't understand you. How is it possible, you know, to get more flexible use of airspace in different nations. And I visited the chief of the Air Forces, and in turn, they said, for instance, the chief of the French Air Force said, we are so flexible, we are giving so much airspace to the civilian side, but they are not using it. How is that possible? Right? So then we did an, uh, a research, and we saw on so-called heat maps that the areas in the week were not used, then on the weekend were not used. So there was the same heat maps. And we saw, okay, how is that possible? How is it possible that the civilians are not using the free airspaces? And now we're doing research in Brittany to make sure that we understand that. But you need to think about from gate to gate. If you fly from Madrid to Frankfurt and flying across Spain and France and Germany using all the empty areas, you are 10 minutes early. Are you able to land? Probably not because you have a slot time, so you're going to a holding. You do it as a pilot two to three times, and then you don't use the direct way anymore. And then when you land, you are on a taxiway and stop there for the passenger's perception. You are not able to go to the gate, 
frustration. And when you are at the gate on time, but you don't get the luggage, then you are frustrated as well, although you are earlier, right? So we need to research here, and we need to work much more together. That's why next year, um, the DG endorsed a conference together with the uh, ICAO and Eurocontrol, and we invite the leadership of the airlines, airports, and the military at least to talk together, right? To exchange information to make sure, okay, that we understand each other in the future. As far as airspaces are concerned, we will have a much higher demand in the future and the new normal as far as military aircraft is concerned. We will have modern aircraft, the F-35. In 10 years, we will have over 400 F-35s in Europe. And they have a much bigger demand in space, in distance, with the modern weapons, also with the fourth generation aircraft like a Eurofighter, with the weapons to use airspace. And we don't have this airspace here in Europe. Last week, I was at the Air Chief Symposium with all the NATO Air Chiefs in Rammstein, together with partner nations, and we discussed these issues. And one of the ideas is to establish a big airspace in the north, over the North Sea. The same size, or the, the same principle of airspace as we see in the Baltic states together with Poland. It took us years, from the NATO perception, to get a combined airspace. But after the 24th of February, then we had an airspace. In March, and Saulius, you know that, we talked about it very, very often, a lot of hurdles were gone away. There was a combined effort between the civilian side and the military side to open a temporary established segregated area. Temporary and segregated. That means it's not open the whole time, only on demand. Because air policing flying for a fighter pilot is a very simple task. But they have to do more training. When they're four months in the Baltics, States, they need to fly advanced training, 2v2, 4v4, air-to-air refueling, electronic warfare, close air support, and so on. And that's what they're doing now, in a combined airspace where also an F-35 can, fly, uh, can fly, uh, fly in the future. And around the North Sea, we have all F-35 nations in the future, to include Belgium and the United States in Lake Nice. And they can fly there day to day, but there should no big concern because it's a temporary area. Open most of the time for all the traffic. And I asked the air chiefs to look into it and said, OK, let's do a harmonized approach. When you have a simulator week, do a combined simulator week. When you do big exercises, only use parts that you really need. Right? And take times when you have low traffic, low commercial traffic. Don't take the times when it's uh, high traffic. And they will think about it. On the military side, they can do much better. And we saw that in the eastern side, where we are flying now as well. Airspaces are giving back to the civilian side too late, not early enough. Although we have all software and all principles there. The processes are there to do that. But it's a question of mindset in the end of the day to do this. And the mindset is also here necessary to change our thinking as far as usage of the European airspace is concerned. We will have a raise in traffic in the next years, commercial-wise, but also in higher demand on the uh, military side. This calls for cooperation. This calls for synchronization. And this calls for a change in mindset on all sides. And we are trying to facilitate this for the Eurocontrol to make sure, OK, we are talking to each other and making sure, OK, we are understand us. In addition to that, we will see new entries. And last week, I was in the US technology conference in London. And it was, for me, very eye-open to see how diverse the situation about unmanned I area vehicles is. We, we heard this morning about VTOLs, the business case. Is there a business case? How to use lower airspace, use spaces? Regulations are coming out from the EASA. But the nations are looking differently to it. If you go to Croatia, they have a completely different demand on lower airspace drones than they have in Sweden. Sweden has a much bigger airspace, but Croatia doesn't. Croatia has a problem of smugglers and of migration, which Sweden doesn't have. Right? So this is a different story, and, and that can be national-wise. But what we need to harmonize is the airspace where normal aircraft are flying, where we see the predators, the Heron TPs flying in the future from the military perception. And I asked the military airship to say, OK, look into it, come up with an own plan 
how do you want to use it together with the civilian side? And there are good examples in place. In France, they are the first testing going with Spain together, fly these aircraft in a normal airspace. And it's possible. But also, it's a mindset change here as well. On the ground, there is a pilot sitting. These aircraft are not flying alone. And he has a license, or she has a license, to fly, and, 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 and they know how to do that. Okay? And then we need to think about, okay, what happens in a case of an emergency? Well, kind of the same as we have an emergency with a normal aircraft as well. So there is no big concern. And then we have the higher airspace. The ECHO program from the EU, uh, European Union together with us, high altitude operations, and I ask the air chiefs, look at this as well. Do you want to regulate this area or not? It is not regulated in, in the moment above flight level 660. So we need to make sure that we have a common approach. And the same goes for CNS optimization. Harmonization, in principle, is a reduction. And I ask the air chiefs, okay, look into it as well. You need to come up with your own strategy. What do you want? in combination with the civilian side. We need to be much more transparent. We can have a lot of things that we can do and use. Think about it. We spare a lot of money, a lot of efforts, and only a small part can be classified in a you know, conflict situation or a crisis situation. But you need to come up with a plan. NATO is now trying to get a CNS strategy out synchronizing everything what the nations you know, put in. So I hope that we can synchronize also with the civilian side, knowing that there's a lot of industry behind in different nations. But there are also opportunities right, to go forward together with interoperability and standardization using different equipment, which we are doing in the air anyhow. Right? But we need to have a common approach to, uh, to make that happen. And last but not least, space. We will have a lot of space launches in the future. And I visited the uh, Federal Administration, uh, Aviation Administration in the United States this year. They have 100 launches this year. They're closing airspace. And a lot of commercials, uh, airlines need to divert around it, right? The launch and the re-entry area. A lot of demand. And we will see the same here in Europe in the future. How we want to approach this. This is a question we need to answer from the civilian side, but also for the military side, because a lot of launches will be from the government, from the military side as well. To make a long story short, we need to go into the future together. This is my pledge for, for today. And we need to change our mindset in working much closer together, in harmonizing much more, from the nation's perception, from the military perception, and also from the civilian side. And that's why I've tried to get you know, both sides closer together. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So I just want to wrap up. It'll just take about two minutes. And like all events that happened today, it all is because of you guys taking the time to travel and come here. And I really do appreciate that. We had over 350 people here today. It's really very good. Logistically, everybody back traveling, it's great to see it. And we had a huge presence online as well today. And we'll send you the data later. So it's a special thanks to everybody who traveled. But I also just want to say a special thanks to my team here in your control who put the event together, Kyla and her comms team. I think we have to say thanks. The production team here, <laughs> you know. And also thank Jacopo who did the, the comparing for us today to make sure that the whole thing went away. So thank you, Jacopo and the team. So, you know, without wrapping up too much, I just want to make two, two points. The first one is that the industry depends on people. Without people, you don't have anything. And there's no industry uses people as much as aviation. 
And I, I'm always consistent about this. We have in aviation, you know, a kind of an ecosystem that at the very top you have the pilots and the air control, traffic controllers making a lot of dosh, and at the very bottom you've got the bag hand, baggage handlers and all these guys who need to be paid better, in my view. And this is always a thing we've got to keep going to make sure that our ecosystem in total works together, because one piece of it will stop it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is technology. I think we learned today with the panels that we saw today that technologically, there's great technological solutions to get out of there, but we can only do it by working together. So all I want to say to everybody today is safe home. Um, Gunari and Boher live. August um, Slánawala, that's my chonga Gwega from Irish language. And um, thank you for visiting Eurocontrol today. And we'd hope to see you again probably this time next year or even sooner. So Gunari and Boher live. Thank you. Thank you.